Get impact over with. Again, I hated this program. It's been a day. I haven't even thought about it in 24 hours, so maybe I'll be a little more, uh, a little more lenient on it here. Maybe not, since SmackDown got me all riled up with its fucking stupidity. So Impact opened up with Hulk on the phone with Angle. Angle's getting ready to go, and he told Hulk to take care of his back. He'd take care of things at the Impact Zone. Vowed to take out Abyss. Vowed to win the title. Said he had to go. The show was starting. Hogan would not let him get off the phone, so he's like, I've got to go. That was funny for some reason. So they loaded him into his entrance ramp. Up he went. That was actually pretty cool. So he came out and cut a promo. Said Hogan was in a hospital bed recovering from surgery. Said he planned to achieve his ultimate goal at the pay-per-view. Only two things stood in his way. Hardy and Abyss. Said he wasn't going to let him down. Said Abyss kept talking about 10-10-10, but tonight was 9-30-10. The night he took him out in a cage match. So, Kurt Angle announces that they're going to have a cage match tonight. Yes. So then Abyss comes out, and they brawl. And they brawl to the back. It's out of control. They brawl for like ten minutes. They keep brawling. I'm wondering why the fuck we should give a fuck about their match at this point, since they brawled for ten minutes. They fought back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Finally, security breaks it up. And... They literally went for so long, I did not care at all about seeing them wrestle. And by the way, for those of you who think I'm being harsh on this, I can read you the quarter hours right here, and you'll never guess what the lowest rated segment on the show was. Cage match? Of course. It was cage match. The, the show just fell off a cliff when Angle and Abyss came out for their cage match. And it did not go up when they continued going all the way into uh, whatever that show is afterwards. Yeah. Uh, whatever. What's that show called? Reaction. Reaction. Yes. So, yeah, this failed. This? This failed. Was the dumbest... Match booked ever. Yeah. Okay. Beyond the fact there was a cage match for no reason un- uh, with no build, therefore it, did not, could not, it could not pop a rating. If this was real, why would you risk both of your pay-per-view main events when one guy's a monster running around with a board of nails and the other guy has vowed to take him out? <laughs> why? Angle said that Abyss, last week he took Hardy out. If he took him out, why is he still in the pay-per-view? What else? Why did they skip two months of storylines to get to this match? Why not have Angle win, then face Abyss? My big question, and I, this is one of those things where, yes, I know they didn't do this just to fuck with me, but I can't help but think it. It did come right after your thing on stip matches. Could you not? It did. Like, well, I mean, this has been taped in advance, but still. Okay, you want to do a main event in a cage. So, would it have been that hard to have them brawl to the back and have it be totally out of control and then announce that because this is so wild and untamable, they are going to have to fight in a cage. Would that have been so fucking hard? Did they have to announce the cage match first and then fucking brawl? Yes. I mean, really. Really. You You would have just had to change the order of one fucking thing. They could not even do that. No. I hate this so show. So they did, in fact, brawl. Uh, they brawled for eight minutes Yeah. before security finally showed up. Probably longer than the match itself. I was trying to figure out why security was taking so long to get there. Perhaps the impact zone is 20 miles long and they were on foot. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, perhaps it only appears every 100 years like Brigadoon. I don't know. But security finally arrived and separated them. Then we got a commercial break. And Why isn't security just always around? Then we got the security, a commercial break. When they came back, they were brawling again. Yeah. So, yes, that sucked. You know, it's just like, okay, you know. (laughs) Okay, so this is a terrible analogy, but I'm just going to say it. There's a lot of drug wars in Mexico. I've heard. Okay, so they, they, you know, for a while they were bringing in the military. Duh. (laughs) So if you're running the fucking impact zone, and every week without question there's at least three wild brawls, Hire more security. You know what I mean? <laughs> Keep it around all the time. I mean, these, follow these are things, all the wrestlers. If, if you just watch the show and pretend it's real, I mean, these people are completely fucking incompetent. Yeah. Angle and Abyss, no shit they're going to get in a brawl. Hello? 
Now, this brawls with everybody every week. So they manage to brawl for seven minutes before security shows up. Something's wrong with the way you run in this company. Tommy Dreamer and Rhino faced beer money in a lumberjack match. What? Right? <laughs> why, why, why? So, a pointless, stupid stip that makes absolutely no sense. So, they do the match. Dreamer makes a comeback. Breaks down. A brawl breaks out on the outside. Pretty shitty brawl, mind you. And so, AJ blows something, alcohol presumably, in Dreamer's eyes. And Storm immediately hits the backcracker and makes the cover. And, of course, Tommy Dreamer kicks out in the opener. Why? Well, I don't know. No one knows. A waste of a perfectly good fuck finish. He just kicked out of it. And then they immediately went to the finish, which was Storm trying to use the beer bottle, but Dreamer grabbed him and gave him the Death Valley driver for the pin. Flair was pissed off. Sabu did a dive. And then Foley cut a promo and demanded Flair get into the ring. Now, I spent 15 minutes arguing with Dave about this segment last night. I spoke my piece, that being that I felt that this was one-third great, one third nonsensical and one third very sad. And wow, actually, that's very close to how I felt. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead. What were your the, thoughts on this segment? We'll start with the great stuff. Their delivery and their emotion and their passion was unreal. Agreed. Unmatched. Agreed. No one in the business could have done this besides these two men. Agreed. What the hell were they so passionate about? <laughs> I don't Why know. were they so worked up? Don't know. What happened? They've both been on the show for a year now, I think. They uh, had one face-to-face promo about a month ago when Foley mentioned something about a phone call at Christmas. And now here they are again. Now they're at each other's throat suddenly. I don't get it. don't understand. And, yes, by the end, when these two men had punched... I can't even say themselves. Each man punched himself bloody. And they were screaming about fighting... And then Ric Flair started throwing random pelvic thrusts, and I looked at it and I just thought, you are two crazy old men. Crazy old men. Yeah. And they're going to fight. Yeah. I think it's going to be a really sad match. Yes. Flair got a hell of a match out of Jay Lethal, or vice versa, however you want to look at it. That should have been his retirement match. Because <laughs> I don't think he's going to top that match with Mick Foley. Maybe he will. No, he won't. He's probably right. My last line here was, this was two crazy, crazy old fuckers, and it was really kind of sad. We had a meeting with Bischoff and Anderson backstage. This random talk about Hogan, I said. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. I do. Ken Anderson, I, I, he's, I, I guess he's technically a babyface. It's hard to tell on the show. But he was whining and crying because Hulk Hogan had called to talk to Angle and had not called him. Eighth grade girl drama is what TNA is now. It wasn't. Well, didn't Ken Anderson and Kurt Angle have a match in a blood feud? Is, is, is yeah, they had did a thing with the uh, the medals. Yeah, and the dog the dog tags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they're now Ken is expected to be high on his Christmas card list. Well, he's he's up. Well, he didn't expect Ken uh, didn't expect Kurt to call him. He wanted Hulk to call him. I see. He wants to be treated as the top guy. When he's not treated as the top, not treated as the top guy, his his uh, course of action is to bitch and moan to Eric Bischoff. Hmm. So, Bischoff told Ken he wanted him to beat up Samoa Joe tonight. And literally, until this exact instant, I didn't realize the dynamic of this. Of Bischoff supposedly being a babyface and wanting babyface Ken to beat up heel Samoa Joe. Because until I thought about it, last night when I watched this, I presumed that Bischoff and Anderson were both heels and Joe was supposed to be the babyface. I don't know. I could be wrong. We'll get to this later, too. Bishop and Ken are supposed to be baby faces. I think so. They are, yes, for sure. Okay. I know this now. Generation Me and Ink Ink. They had a good basic tag match until a spot that just... The <laughs> double Rana? No. Oh. This infuriated me for some reason. And, yes, it is a little stupid thing, but it's another example of why nothing gets over anymore and why... Generation Me are supposed to be heels, and number one, you can't take them seriously because they look ten. Mm-hmm. And the other reason you can't take them seriously is because the psychology of this match was retarded. So, <laughs> they did a spot where Max and Shannon, I believe, are in the ring together. This is near the beginning. 
and Max runs up the rope, and he does a backflip, and he lands behind Shannon. He then acts like he blew out his knee. He rolls outside. He's selling his knee. The ref goes over to check on him, and the other buck gets in the ring and lays out Shannon, and that's how they get the heat. Now, it used to be that at the beginning of the match, the babyface would outwrestle the heel. And no matter what the heel did, the babyface would outwrestle him. And finally, the heel would have to resort to cheating tactics in order to get the upper hand. That's what made people dislike them. That's what made them heels. Here, the heel was in full control of the match. He had just run up, done a flip, and completely evaded the babyface. He was facing the babyface, who had his back turned to the heel. And instead of just attacking the babyface, he faked an injury while he was in control so that his other friend could take out the babyface, who was already at a disadvantage. What? There is that. There is that. There's, that's actually not the spot that bothered me. He got the heat on Jesse. He made a hot tag to Shannon Moore. He's running wild on both uh, both Jim and me guys, and he ducks the double clothesline, and he comes back, and he leaps high into the air, Yes. and he wraps his legs around both of their heads, and Hurricane Hur- Hur- is both of them at the same time. Both members of Generation Me together could not resist the momentum of Shannon Moore's body. Mm-hmm. This is one where you just point at the TV and scream, That was fake! Yeah. This made the Canadian Destroyer look like a sleeper hold. I don't know. That didn't bother me too much. What did bother me at the end was the low blow finish where, again, Max did a, a flip or a go behind or something like that, so he was momentarily in control of the match, and then he delivered a low blow, and then he got the pin. Yes. It's not like they were face-to-face, and, and he was in a hold, and he kicked him low while the ref wasn't looking. No, he uh, he took over on offense and then cheated. So, so. This they, business has passed me by. They, but I've known that for a while. Went to uh, kill Jesse Neal with the double DDT that's been taking out the machine guns, but then the machine guns came out to make the save. Earlier in the show, the machine guns were shown walking backstage, so I'm glad they waited patiently to get their revenge until the match was over. Oh, well, sure, why not? Yeah. Well, they did cut an awesome promo, actually, afterwards. Shelly like was. I thought Shelly was great. She- Shelly's, Shelly's delivery was fine. I, it was really good. But. As he was talking, the camera was focused on Chris Saban trying to look mean. Well, that failed. And Shelly was... Shelly did not suck, but all I can think of was these guys are the anti-Tyler Black, where they are much better when they're trying to be cool and funny, and Tyler Black is great when he's pissed off. I actually thought it was a pretty good promo, and it made sense. He said that uh, they were going to give these guys a title match at the pay-per-view, but first off, next week they were all going to be together in the big battle royal, and they said, it does not matter how many bodies are in the ring, we are going to climb over all of them to get to you. Great! A great babyface promo. Mr. Anderson and the Pope. Pope came out to do commentary with Nash and Sting. Anderson and Joe. Anderson and Joe, I'm sorry. There you go. So Joe beat the piss out of him. <laughs> he chopped the fuck out of him. He hit him as hard as possible. I laughed. Boy, did I laugh. Anderson made a comeback. Joe went for the choke. And then Anderson just fought free and hit a mic check for the pin. So Joe well, was thrilled at the finish, I'm by the sure. Way. Yeah. But, uh, the, hey, you know what? I said the same thing. Well, sort of the same thing about Undertaker and Punk. Anderson's in the title match. Joe is on the show, but he's in a tag match that I guarantee you no one will care about. The right man won here. Yeah. He won clean. No complaints. Uh, match was... The match was okay, but it was the finish was just like, we're going to put this match together. This was a finish that really didn't get anybody over. Not uh, sure. It came off like, you know, Joe laid down for the pin. It, or they something like that. Com- they didn't have like a really competitive thing with a bunch of near falls and that sort of thing. And then Anderson, Anderson you know, did not squash Joe the way Undertaker squashed CM Punk. No. So then Nash announced he wanted to talk to Joe. And all I could think was, why? Why do you care about this guy who just lost? So... He didn't. Joe didn't want to hear what he had to say, so he came back to commercial. Sting, Kevin Nash, and the Pope were in the ring. They took turns cutting promos. Kevin Nash said, and this is almost a direct quote, nobody knows what's going on except the three of them. Yeah. In fucking deed. <laughs> that is true. Pope got a promo saying, here, there's a great promo, by the way. He was just being Pope, and he was awesome. He said Bischoff was a liar, a cheat, and a con man. He said he and Kevin were from the streets. 
That was all. Sting started talking about uh, this is all about him and Hulk. He mentioned WCW, a company that's been dead for a decade, and people cheered. I'm surprised. He asked the fans that they came to see the good guys or the bad guys, and the fans cheered for the bad guys. Sting then pointed out, I'm not making this up. Sting said nobody knows who the bad guys and the good guys are, and the fans kind of went, you know that's true? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was, they did not boo. They did not cheer. They said, he's got a point there. The man has a point. He suggested that it, uh, they change the match to Sting and Nash and Pope versus Jarrett and Joe and Hulk for Brown for Glory. And he said this would somehow answer questions. I don't know how. I love that Bischoff came out with Miss Tessmacher, and he does not care at all that she was fucking at least two of the guys in the ring. Oh. And apparently Bischoff. <laughs> sure. So there you go, everybody. That he, tells you something about Bischoff. He got his turn. So he then started talking about politics in wrestling. Okay. Every time Eric Bischoff starts droning on about fucking backstage maneuverings, I want to take my shoe and throw it in my television set. I want to take a blowtorch and melt my TV. I don't... There's nothing in this... In wrestling that I hate more than guys going on TV and talking about backstage politics. Is there ever... This is a question for Mookie Ghana and anyone else who does stats or any, Carl Stern, any historians. Has there ever in the history of this fucking business been an angle that meant jack shit that involved backstage politics? Can anyone name one? No. Try to name like a single one that even came close. Any angle at any time that had to do with backstage politics that drew a fucking penny. There's not a single one. And they do it all. And that's, that's Russo's deal. Mm -hmm. That's Russo's go-to, is we got to talk about backstage politics. Nobody fucking cares about backstage politics. They just don't. So stop. So he said that Hogan would be there next week and answer in front of the whole world, whether it be in the tag match. Said, I just hope you like the answer. So, yeah, they're dragging out poor Hulk on live TV next week. That poor fucker. Poor fucker. So, he also had a line in here where he said he had known Sting and Nash since WCW, and he said he had talked to them about how their time was running out 15 years ago! Yeah. He's an idiot. They're all idiots. <laughs> They've not gotten younger, everyone. Their time is apparently out, or perhaps expired in 2005. I don't know. I'm just quoting what he said. And then, as the segment came to a close, there was something actually miraculous that happened. For the past six months or so, this company has employed a woman named Brooke Adams in the role of Miss Tessmacher. She's an ass model. Not a bikini model, even. She's an ass model. And as the segment came to a close, she and Bischoff walked to the back, and I believe, for the first time on, te on television, she turned her back to the camera. Mm -hmm. A goddamn miracle. Yeah. That they occurred to them to put her ass on TV. But she was in a skirt, so you couldn't see anything. It was, and it wasn't even a good skirt. No. But there is a step in the right direction. It is a step it's in the a right jumping direction. jumping off point. They could find, like, a girl with the biggest tits in the world, and, and they'd it, only show her face. Or her feet. Yeah. Idiots. Flair got iced again, of course. So It was funny once. Yeah. They're going to do it every fucking week now. Yes. They just are. The, actually, the funniest part of this was when it was AJ, AJ was cutting a promo on Kendrick, and as he's... Talking about what he's going to do to him. Flair just screams, he's a buck 40. I laughed. Flair, uh, we had clips of Red winning, losing the X title in the house show loop. This was awesome. About a minute total, maybe. You, you just, and, Probably and, 30 seconds. And the message was, buy a ticket to go to a TNA house show, because you may get lucky and see a title change hands that will be reversed on the very next show. Yeah. Ready to go. They were also in here running down the card and the cage match later. The cage match with Kurt Angle and Abyss. And somebody said, it's a cage match. No one can save the monster. What a shitty monster. Yeah. Monsters should not be saved. Not to mention the fact he just broke out, but that's another story we'll entirely. We'll check for that later. Miss Tessmacher backstage with the all the heel girls, or the babyface girls or whatever. All the girls. I... I fast-forwarded through this segment. That's fair. I, I gave it 15 it, seconds. It was very awful. This was the most annoying thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I would have preferred a segment where Melina just screamed for 30 seconds. <laughs> I've never fucking been so... It's, every girl in TNA is a bitch. Yes! You notice that? And, and it's not... It's not a saying that. They use that term. 
Also yeah, whore. Yeah. He also collects the whore all the time. You, you never, you know, like there's, you know, you watch WWE and, you know, Kelly Kelly is supposed to be a sweet girl. Yeah. She's supposed to be a nice, sweet, baby face girl. The Fella Twins are same as boring. Stacey Keebler, when she was a baby face, she was just a nice, sweet, pretty girl. Trish Stratus was a nice, sweet girl. Then she stabbed Chris Jericho in the back and became a bitch. Sure. But when she was a baby face, she, she was, was just, a baby face. Here in TNA, every girl is a bitch. Yes. Every one of them. If you're a baby face, you're a bitch. If you're a heel, you're a bitch. And no matter what you are, you're a whore. This is exactly how they book the girls. Don't and, yell at me. And they use those terms. I am using the exact words that TNA uses in all their segments. They did nothing but scream at each other for I don't know how long about I don't know what, so I fast forward. <laughs> I, did, well, I actually did watch the entire thing. I don't know why. It was very, very horrible. Uh, one of the worst segments I've ever seen. I had no idea what they were talking about. Something about getting a waiver for Tara to get back in the ring, even though she's been back in the ring wrestling for like a month now. They call each other whores and bitches a lot, and Brooke announced there was going to be a four-way title match at the pay-per-view. And Selena said she didn't want to do the match because she and Velvet just got back together. On the one hand, this made her look like a cowardly champion. On the other hand, she made an excellent point. So they all bitched each other. <laughs> they then all left still angry. It was so bad I couldn't even get pissed off. I could just marvel how bad it was. And then they all left. Brooke got a phone call, and she said, Hello. The usual, okay, 20 minutes. So she was going to go have sex with someone for money. Mm -hmm. Because she's a whore. Yeah, of course. <sighs> AJ against Brian Kendrick, who is a baby face who now thinks he's a Jedi. <laughs> is that the gimmick? I just noticed he was wearing a white robe that was 47 sizes too big for him. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that there were two positives in this match. One, it was a good match. Well, it lasted, which was like a minute. And two, Ric Flair distracted the referee and legitimately distracted him, leading to the finish, which is unlike 95% of the fuck finishes in TNA where the referee is looking right at the interference and does nothing. So that was a positive. We had a backstage promo with Abyss. He vowed to take Kurt, Kurt Angle out tonight. And he wanted the match with RVD about for going to be Monster's Ball. I had just assumed it was going to be anyway. And I'm RVD. Not, and I'm not more excited to see the show now that I know for sure. RVD tape promo outside in L.A., he had his goofy bandages on. I have no idea what he was talking about. He, he said, I just like that he said he had he had been stupid and gotten hurt again. I loved how this is like TNA where it starts with a cage match, then it becomes an Ultimate X match, and then the blow-off is a regular wrestling match. A wrestling match, match where they've seen holds. When he called in three weeks ago, he was completely fine. He had no injuries. He did not care about the attack. He was feeling great. Life was good. He comes back last week. He's bandaged up, but overall he's okay. Now the third week, he's still bandaged up, and now he's talking about how he needs the universe to heal him so a doctor can clear him. <laughs> right. What? That's what he said. I just like, he came back last week and announced that he would be cleared, he would be cleared for the 10-10-10 show. Then he gets beat up by Abyss, and he says he's had a, he's suffered a setback. A setback. But he's going to need the doctors to clear him so he can wrestle on the 10-10-10 show. How is that a setback? I, I don't know. They then aired several minutes, devoted several minutes of the television show to promote the pay-per-view? No! Next week's Live Impact. Abyss and Kurt Angle in the completely random cage match. Uh, Angle I thought it completely point in this cage match, by the way. Grabbed the nail covered board and threw it out of the cage. And I realize it landed in the aisle, but it bounced high in the air and nearly hit a production guy. They're dead. They're determined to hurt somebody yes. in this fucking company. Well, this uh, stagehand died that one time, so there was absolutely no heat. And then Kurt gigged because, of course. You gotta have blood on every show. Even and though we saw it earlier in the show. We didn't, not only did we see it earlier, we saw two guys do it to themselves. So then Can't be that bad. Angle climbs the cage, they go off the air. It's a teaser to make us watch reaction. Which by the way, people have figured this out, this bullshit, because now they just apparently turn off at a quarter till because they don't want to watch TNA for three hours. I don't know what the deal is. No one wanted to see this match, that's number one. But so Abyss throws the ref into the cage. And uh, they botched a black hole slam. Mr. Anderson hits the ring. House of Fire. He goes one-on-one, face-to-face with the Can you heel. Can imagine, everyone? Yep, climbs Mr. Inside. Anderson hits the ring. 
Climbs inside, goes one-on-one, face-to-face with the heel, and the heel beats him up. Of course, he's an idiot. So here's one of your challengers for the world title, beaten up like a complete dork. And then Abyss just tears the door off the cage because, you know, it's a cage. doesn't keep anyone in or out anymore. So he goes to get his board, but Kurt grabbed it, and the show went off the air. This was one of the most horrible impacts of all time. And, of course, once Abyss got the stick, he was suddenly vulnerable. Yeah. Stick is poison. That was a bad show. This I, show was horrible. I did not eat it as much as you did, but I will not defend it in any way. This show was fucking horrible, everybody. To the back! So I have my impact notes here. Should we get going? Yeah, we'll go for it. All right, impact opened with a... Oh, fuck. Let me start. Because <laughs> I remember how stupid this fucking a thing fucking was. fucking stupid pile of shit segment, yes. Oh, God. I will say, you know what? I'm going to say one thing about this. Okay. The segment itself was pretty fucking stupid. In the sense that, for those that didn't see the show, Abyss... I can't even say he kidnapped her. Okay? There was a hostage situation. Abyss had taken Dixie Carter hostage. He was dragging her throughout the building. He had his fucking branding iron and his board covered with nails. And he was dragging her throughout the building, and she was screaming and crying and begging for mercy. A hostage situation. There is no other way to explain what this was. Now, as I was watching this, I thought, well, this is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen. Now, it's bad enough that he killed Rob Van Dam, Mm -hmm. and he was not fired. No. But... How do you get out of firing? How do you get out of firing this man after this? Remember when he branded that one guy? Well, forget about that. I mean, this is a hostage situation with the owner of the fucking company. Mm-hmm. How do you work around the fact that this guy is still going to be employed on Sunday? I was like, I was begging for their stupid answer. The answer ended up being later. Rob Van Dam. After Eric Bischoff had been told to go out and publicly fire Abyss, Rob Van Dam, after Abyss was called to the ring, he came out instead, and he said, Eric, you cannot fire Abyss. I must fight this man. If you fire Abyss before Sunday, I don't care what you do after Sunday. If you want to fire him on Monday... If you want to do whatever you want to do, that's fine. But if you fire this man before my match with him on Sunday, I'm walking. I will quit this company. And so they were forced to allow Abyss to stay through Sunday. Great. It made sense. It made fucking sense. I absolutely, in fact, I will go as far as to say that I never saw that twist coming, and I thought it was awesome. They actually came up with an explanation for how Abyss could take hostage the owner of the fucking company, and he's still around for his pay-per-view match on Sunday. This was great. I would go as far as to say, this was brilliant. Now, with that said, the The segment itself, the segment itself of him taking Dixie hostage, listen, this segment went on about ten minutes. He dragged Dixie from the backstage area towards the ring. She is screaming. He is telling everybody to get out of the way because he's got her and he's got this barbed wire board. There is no security to be seen anywhere. Again, how big is the impact zone? The answer is it's not big at all. Where in the fuck was security? Nobody called the police. Eric Bischoff even called the police over the outsiders once. Do you remember this? Where the police actually were going to pull their guns on Nitro? I remember this. No, no security to be found. So he drags her around forever. He drags her out into the building, drags her out through the crowd. Of course, all the fans are just sitting there. This isn't like Abdul the Butcher in Puerto Rico where people are running for their lives. No. Nope, they're just sitting there like, oh, shitty angle alert. They were sitting there and they were booing. Yeah. Because they knew it was a bad guy and thus they meant they should boo. It. If, it, if there was any chance of this having any credibility, it was blown right there. So then, after literally, this had to have been seven, eight minutes. No security, no cops. Finally, out comes Eric Bischoff, 
First off, where has he been that it took seven minutes to get out there? Eric Bischoff comes out with Gunner and Murphy. Yes. Gunner and Murphy. He proceeds to talk Abyss into letting her go, and then who should come out but road agents? D. Low Brown, Pat Kenny, and Al Snow, and they take her to the back, and that is the end of the hostage situation. And I don't even know what to say. Don't any no everybody, don't go to the impact zone. That is the least safe place in the whole entire world. If they would have kept that segment to about a minute and a half or two minutes, this would have all been perfect. Because I can understand Abyss at the beginning of the show taking the fucking owner hostage and within a minute, within a minute, surrounded by cops, security, and Bischoff talks him out of it. That would have been completely fine. But to drag this on as long as they did, and the best they could get were Gunner, Murphy, Al Snow, Pat Kenny, and Simon Diamond, or D'Lo Brown, that strange credulity to a degree I could not, I just could not handle it. And you're not the only one, because once things calmed down, they dragged Abyss away, Eric was there, uh, huffing and puffing and all, all flustered, and... There's a fan next to him who was laughing and calling him names, <laughs> giving him shit, and Eric looks at this guy like he wanted to kill him, and then got in the ring. So, yeah, this worked on nobody. So Sting came out and went to commercial, came back, Pope and Nash were there, and Pope is talking about 10-10-10, the walls are going to come crashing down on Eric, they are bantering back and forth, they're talking about the wrong direction, and how Pope is going in the wrong direction, and Pope wants to know what it's about, Eric says it's about Sting and Hogan. Sting said that's right. It's about something that happened 10 years ago. It's going to come crashing down at Bound for Glory. By the way, Sting and Hogan were first feuding 13 years ago. Yeah. So, there you go. The point of this was, as I was watching this segment, all I could think was, you guys had better have a fucking hell of an angle on Sunday to make these months of nonsensical segments worth it. They won't. I have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. No. In storyline, nobody else has any idea what anybody's in talking fact, about. In the storyline, Pope had no idea what story he's talking about. Yeah. He asked Bischoff for the real story, and Eric would just say, it's bigger than you. Now, the idea here was that last week, the, I don't even know, the black or white hats, we don't know, they can't say good guys or bad guys, so they used this black and white phrase from the Lone Ranger and we're supposed to know what that means, I guess, if we're smart. Whatever. Regardless, so Sting's crew apparently last week wanted Hulk Hogan in a match at Bound for Glory. Now, they did not even address this during this segment. We were just supposed to remember. And thankfully, I did. So Bischoff finally says, you guys want to know what's up with Hulk Hogan? Well, you're the only ones in the world that are unaware, so take yes. a look at this. Yes, because I was noting here that... They, they, as we discussed before, they book this show sometimes exclusively for, exclusively for fans who are devoted online fans. When they talk about backstage politics and whatnot. So here, Pope Nash and Sting are the only guys in TNA who are not internet fans. Mm -hmm. So they did not know what Hulk Hogan was doing. And then this, I pointed out how stupid they are. Yes. And they posted clips of Hulk coming out of back surgery in rougher shape than you would imagine someone coming out of back surgery would be in. Brooke was there and was very concerned. Doctors were working Actually, over. Kennedy had back surgery, and he was in a coma afterwards. So things are better now. All right, then. That's I'm good. just reading about this, yeah. Did not know that. Yeah. Mr. Kennedy? John oh. F. Oh. The president, not Mr. Oh, Anderson. Back <laughs> surgery was very primitive back in the uh, 50s and 60s. That makes more, makes more sense that Hogan was not then. Yeah. So, anywho, yeah, they, they pointed out that Hogan's in rough, very rough shape. Everyone on Earth knows it, except Sting, Nash, and Pope. They look like idiots. So then they came back. Bischoff, uh... Well, you're, you're, you're downplaying this footage. Hogan looked like a 500-year-old man. Mm -hmm. He looked so sad and broken down. They said it was the eighth surgery since February. Bischoff was saying, are you guys man enough to take this guy on, the three of you, against this, this crippled man? And, uh... Right here... For reasons I cannot discern, I cannot fathom, fans began to chant, fire Eric. Yeah. Apparently it's his fault Hulk broke his back. Yeah. So, he, everybody played their roles during this segment very well. As Nash and Sting and Pope looked at the footage as if, we had no idea. 
and it's kind of sad. I don't know what that means, but that's the look they had on their face. And then Joe and Jarrett came out, and Bischoff told them not to get in the ring. And he ended up signing for Sunday. The match is going to continue just without Hogan. It's Nash and Sting and Pope against Joe and Jarrett in a handicap match, which at least the baby faces are at the disadvantage. And are they? Well, sure. Who's the baby faces? Well, Joe and Jarrett, I'm presuming. But we'll find out Sunday. I actually predict that on Sunday, I predict that Hulk Hogan did get back surgery, but he's not nearly as bad as we have been led to believe, and that it's a work to a degree. Not that he's hurt or that he was in the hospital, because he most certainly was. But I think that on Sunday, they're going to go back to the fucking Bash of the Beach. Mm -hmm. There's going to be Joe and Jarrett against Nash, Sting, and Pope, and Hulk fucking Hogan is going to come out, and everyone's going to think that he's going to be the conquering hero, and he's going to turn heel. Hmm. There you go. I don't care. <laughs> I think he's going to come back and be in agony for nothing. Yeah, so so Bischoff showed this footage, and then he, he challenged Sting and his crew to accept the 3-on-2 match, and everyone just stood there. And before Sting could answer, they cut backstage. Mm-hmm. And the car pulled up, and a camera crew ran up, and Mickey James got out. The, cam- the director said, uh, or the, the interviewer said, Mickey James, what are you doing here? She said, you'll have to wait to find out, and she walked away. That was her debut. That was her debut. Star power, everyone. We had a video package with Team 3D. They're still around. Okay, this is the first of many things that annoy me on the show. A few weeks back, they did a shot of uh, Tommy Dreamer in Yonkers, where I was very skeptical. The skeptical they sent a camera crew to Yonkers, New York. And then we saw Rob Van Dam in L.A. They did about six shots during the show, sending cameras around the nation to interview guys. This was the camera crew in Times Square, New York, with Team 3D cutting a promo. Yeah. Why? <laughs> I don't know. So they cut a promo. The promo was, at the pay-per-view, they're going to make an announcement. Fuck you and your announcement, TNA. An announcement that will change tag team wrestling forever. The biggest announcement of their career. Again, as Lance Storm wrote on his website, Kids, you are paying for an announcement. Not a match. You are paying for an announcement that you can get for free by going online one minute after it's announced or yes. just waiting until next Thursday. Yes. No one is paying shit for announcements in pro wrestling. Angelina Love and Velvet Sky against Tara and Madison Rain with the winning girls getting the beautiful people name and music. As a match, it was god-awful. <laughs> this test mocker was out there. The match went maybe three minutes. All the stipulations, it went maybe three minutes. Angelina and Velvet won. Tanae said, and I quote, just like that. <laughs> yep, just like that. Almost completely pointless. So then Tess Mocker did a promo, talked about the four-way at the pay-per-view, and then she says, to make sure these skanks play by the rules. All you skanks. All you skanks. So even the baby faces are skanks, everyone. <laughs> to make sure all of you skanks Whoever play by the baby. rules. And presumably, Tess Mocker is a babyface calling these girls skanks. I can't tell. Well, I, I don't either, but I, I presume strongly she is suspect of Madison and Tara are heels. The rest of them, I have no idea. Well, I mean, clearly, Angelina is supposed to be a babyface, and Velvet is as well now. But Miss Tess Mocker, I presume, is supposed to be the babyface based on the uh, special referee, but she sure acts like a bitch. The special referee is Mickey James, and again, you know, if she had announced there's going to be a special referee and Mickey James had come out, and that would have been her debut, that would have been a pretty hot deal on live TV. Nope. She arrived ten minutes earlier, got out of a car, said, we'll, yeah. we'll find out soon while I'm here. So, yeah. So she, she, I mean, how do you screw that up? Because, though, no, they're... I expect nothing less. This is what I expect from DNA. She cut a promo, talking about how she was there, she's proud to be there, Said she was sure to be bound for glory, at which point Madison screamed, You are bound for failure! Which may have been my favorite moment of the entire show. She said she was going to make history by winning the belt and becoming the first woman to hold every conceivable woman's title that meant anything in the business. At which point I said, Wait a minute, Tara was a knockout champion, wasn't she? And you pointed out, Yes, but she was never the Divas champion. Yeah. The butterfly belt. Yeah. It means more in TNA than it does in WWE. Well, no, that's not true. 
Because if you go on Twitter, these fucking WWE girls worship these stupid bells. Hmm. I mean, it, it literally... I don't know. It's a divas title. <laughs> the number of titles that mean anything in this business for the women are approximately zero. And the, 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 the knockouts title meant something for a little while when Kong was the champion. Sure. At least that, that is the yeah. one and only time. At least the knockout title has history. At one point, it was cool. The WWE title right now, the woman's title, had been broken in two. But even that, at it least was it a had, charm bracelet. It had the history of Tristratus. Oh. The Divas title has a butterfly. It has Michelle McCool. Yeah. No bias. We had a film crew in Boston, so Mick Foley on his book tour could cut a promo. Why? He cut a promo on Flair, said he wanted Flair to kiss his ass. And then we had Foley and Flair. Oh, we had the Dixie thing first. Dixie was backstage. Six months into Abyss's reign of terror of skinny Rob Van Dam alive, branding random people backstage, trying to set people on fire. She finally decided it was time to fire Abyss. I guess he finally put his hands on her. She then said it was Eric's responsibility. Why? I don't know. Okay, maybe I missed something. There's no good reason for it. But then, not only did she want Eric to fire him, she wanted him... Oh, he protested, by the way. He wanted to try to work out some kind of deal or something. She wanted him humiliated at this. She demanded Eric fire him in the middle of the ring and in front of everyone to humiliate him like she was humiliated. This is retarded. Foley and Flair false count anywhere. All I have to say is that I really feel bad for Foley because... Most likely, this was the last great match of his career. I would say the last great match of both men's careers, but I put nothing past Ric Flair. He's This is actually his second really good match this year. So <laughs> to think this would be his last one would be foolish, unless you anticipate his death like in a month. Which, I don't think that's happening. Flair's going to be the May Young. He's going to be taking backdrops on the thumbtacks when he's 85 years old. I felt bad for Foley because they really did have... I mean, you can talk about how it was kind of sad to see a 62-year-old man taking backdrops in his thumbtacks and them cutting themselves like nobody's business. Flair in particular was, you know, he he probably could have been arrested for the number he did on himself with that razor blade. They had this match, and, you know, despite the violence and the gore and that sort of thing, this was a hell of a match. This was a hell of a wrestling spectacle. Hey, this we, was. We did doubt them last week, and they proved us wrong. Now, with that said, if I were Mick Foley and I had this match and it was so goddamn good and I knew this may be the last one and the finish was so fucking stupid, I really don't know what I would do. I really don't know what I would do. I am happy, personally, I am happy never wrestling again because I really enjoyed that last match with Ryzik. We had a really good match. He hit me with his move, he pinned me, I lost, and I'm upholding the steps. I wish I would have just said, loser leaves town forever. That would have been better. That's the only thing I would have changed about that match. But we didn't have a, some sort of fuck finish or anything like that. He was a better man. Great, because I'm done. I don't give a fuck. That was perfect to me. Poor Foley and Flair go out there. It's false count anywhere. As noted, Flair cuts himself like... He's using a butcher knife. Foley gets thrown off the stage. And, I mean, he flew through the fucking air. High and long. Yes, he did. Through a table, and the table, he kind of overshot it. So he landed fucking hard on the cement. They used thumbtacks. They used barbed wire boards. Flared at a big splash through a table. They pulled out all of the stops. And the fans were into every moment of this match. This was an exceptional match. As noted, yeah, in some ways it was kind of sad, but a hell of a a hell of a match. And then this was the finish. Foley ends up on a table. Flair climbs up to the top rope. Now, as everybody's well aware, Flair always gets thrown off the top rope for the most part. Not tonight. Flair does a big splash and puts Mick Foley through the table. They're both down. Referee starts to count. Now, per the rules of a last man standing match, 
They have 10 seconds to get to their feet. If they cannot get to their feet, they lose. So the ref is counting. Three, four, five. They start to stir. Six. They start making their way up to their feet. Seven. They are now both on their feet. Standing upright. Flair is standing on his feet, and then he takes a flair flop into the tax. The ref says, eight, <laughs> nine, ten. Mick Foley, you are the winner. It would be one thing if, like, Flair got to one knee and then Flair flopped into the tax, for example. Or even if he almost got to the feet and was leaning against the ropes and he had not fully stood up and then he fell into the tax. Nope, Flair got all the way to his feet. He was not touching the ropes at all. He was just standing up. This, and then he did a flare flop. They could have even had the ref focused on Foley and turn his back on Flair for just a second. No. <laughs> that would have he was looking too. right at both of them. They both got to their feet, and then Flair fell down, and so the ref ruled that he had not gotten up, I guess, in the first place. I just, and the announcers were, like, trying to figure out what happened, and, and Taz said something like, well, you know, Earl Hebner's done a lot of these. I'm sure it was a good call. <laughs> just like, to have worked so goddamn fucking hard in what might have been your last match, and, and the finish, that's the finish, I would have just been so sad. But if you, keep, if you take that out, everybody, and the idea that Flair did the offensive move and he was the one that lost, I'm not sure quite how that works, but regardless, a hell of a wrestling match until a very shitty finish. We then got the segment with RVD and Bischoff, where he... Bischoff called out Abyss. Actually, it was great. He came out first. The table was still there. The thumbtacks were still out. He started talking about he had never seen a car wreck like this, and suddenly a woman came to the ringside, got his attention. Eric went over and talked to her and said, We don't have time! <laughs> Live TV, everyone. That was funny. Uh, he then called out Abyss. They went to commercial. When they came back, instead of Abyss, RVD came out. He talked about the code they have in the back. said when the wrestlers have issues, they want to settle them. They don't go to management. And this is where he said that he can't, if he can't wrestle Abyss of Brown for Glory, then he will quit. That was that. We then had Tommy Dreamer and Rhino in Philadelphia, outside the bingo hall. Fans were lined up for some other wrestling show. They were going down, high-fiving all of them. Rhino was cutting a very intense promo. Tommy Dreamer was very mellow. That was it. This was supposed to make us want to buy the pay-per-view. I could not figure out why Foley and Flair was on at the top of hour one. I was like, what is going to follow this match? Nothing. Why Why is this match not the main event? The the, the $100,000 Battle Royal is going to be better than this. I'll bet you a, a million dollars it's not. You would have I was won. right, by the way. You would have won. So what do they follow this with but Eric Young and Orlando Jordan against Ink Ink? Stop right there. There was a skit beforehand. Now, at least this camera crew may have been just somewhere in uh, Universal Studios. Because you see, Orlando Jordan and Eric Young went to the fair. They threw balls at milk uh, milk jugs, tried to knock them over. Eric Young explained they were a tag team. He said before long they would be in PWI. Pro Wrestling Illustrated, everyone. Yeah, ranked as a great tag team. Yes, and then they shared an awkward hug. Well, yeah. it wasn't awkward for Orlando. That's but... true. He was fine with it. Eric Young was very awkward. And then we got the match. Eric and Orlando against Ink, Ink. And by the way... They noted that Eric had taken a bump onto his head, and it had scrambled his brains, Mm -hmm. so now he is goofy. Yes. In 2010. This was funny when it happened to, like, Bugs Bunny and Daffy in the, I don't know, 50s, 40s? But, yes, this is a real human being in a sport that involves a lot of head injuries. Yeah. In 2010, that's their storyline. This guy so. got bonked in the head so many times. Ha <laughs> ha! His brain's He's fucked up. crazy or stupid or punch drunk or whatever. So the announcers were talking about how Orlando and Eric have been winning matches on Explosion. And we're seeing clips from Explosion. And the next thing you know, on Explosion, Orlando and Eric lose. Mm-hmm. And Taz had to stop himself mid-sentence and say, oh, they lost that one. <laughs> so the gimmick here is that Eric Young is so gone fucking stupid sometimes. He's <laughs> gone bonkers. He... Came out with Orlando, he posed with Orlando, and then as soon as the match started, he forgot who his partners were. 
He ran in. He locked up with Orlando. Yeah, you okay, know, he's got multiple concussions. He tried to tag out to the guys on the other team. Uh, he kept screwing on his partner over constantly. They should call him Team CTE. <laughs> there was a point where Orlando made a cover with his foot on the ropes. Eric pointed this out. So after all of this incompetence, this bumbling idiocy, they won anyway. Uh, Way to make Ink Ink look like complete tools. And here I am thinking, what in the fuck was the point of this on the Go Home show? And the answer is because they have agreed to rematch on Sunday after this debacle. They want us to pay to see this again. Bullshit. Eric claimed it would be a six man with the four of them. Because you see, his brains are scrambled. Ha! <laughs> I fell from a height. He's shit. Fuckers. Shit, this was. We had Jay Lethal showing off his childhood home in New Jersey. Talked about having to shovel snow in the very long driveway. That's why he lives in Tampa now. He did have a funny story about how they had the car that he drove to all his shows when he was working out of there. And then once a promoter was willing to fly him to Ohio, and his father turned down the flight because he wanted to do a road trip. That's a great story. And we had a very important segment, I, I would guess, come Sunday. Dixie was telling RVD, fine, but win, lose, or draw, Abyss is finished after the pay-per-view. And Bischoff showed up with what he claimed were termination papers, effective at midnight Sunday. And she hurriedly signed without reading them. Mm -hmm. So, most likely, she just signed over the company to them, who would be Hogan and Eric. Which, I will suspend my disbelief, but legally... Especially the fact that this was captured on oh, camera. Yes. This would never fly. <laughs> this would never fly. She ordered RVD to take Abyss out. I suspect intent was missing from this contract signing. They have to ask Todd about it sometime. Yeah. We then got the debut of Shore. Yeah. And when I say the debut of Shore, I mean they started off with a wide shot of the impact zone. They played a wacky video with music. These two came out. And they got in the ring and cut a promo. Music. What it was was a club song written by a country group in Nashville. <laughs> it fucking sucks. That's also true. But my point here is that there was nothing to indicate this is a new act at all. This was just two more people in TNA. They got in the ring. They talked about abs. They threw out a few lines. We had Cookie, who was a large-breasted girl. Mm -hmm. And we had Robbie E., who, unfortunately for him... And TNA, it doesn't matter who came up with the idea for this gimmick first. He comes off as an indie version of Zack Ryder. And think about that. <laughs> yes. So they were effectively annoying, but I don't think in a good way, as the fans hated this segment. I'm almost positive they were chanting boring. They were chanting something. Mm -hmm. And they, Jersey Shore, or I guess just Shore, because I don't know. Whatever. They know. talked and talked and talked. Everybody booed. And uh, they're going to be back next week. This did not work. I. That's true. I do not watch Jersey Shore. I've seen far bigger failures in TNA. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of failures, this was only about a uh, 3. Most most TNA failures are, are hovering around a 9 or a 10. So we'll see what happens with this crew. Perhaps. I mean, a lot of people do watch that show. Perhaps they will hear about this and want to check it out. Why, though? I don't know. There are, there have been worse theories than trying to imitate something that is, that is very popular. I'm trying to figure out the last time pro wrestling tried to imitate something that was popular, which was successful. Don't know. <laughs> All right. If anybody knows, feel free to post it on the board. We then got a segment that I considered a much bigger failure than the debut of Shore. They aired a bunch of clips of everyone talking about how important Bound for Glory was to TNA. There was one great moment here. And what would that be? The one great moment was they interviewed Angle, Nash, RVD, Pope, Anderson, Jarrett, I saw Claire Foley, now names after a while. Joe, and Dixie. And the three best moments were, first off, Kevin Nash had the excitement level of a corpse. And he's trying to sell us on this pay-per-view. Dixie claimed this would be the biggest TNA event in their history. Howled with laughter when I heard that one. And finally, we had Mr. Anderson, who was slightly more animated than Kevin Nash. He also may have been a reanimated corpse. And he said, in the most boring, monotone manner possible, 
TNA has reignited my passion for the business. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he did. Your passion is just fucking through the roof, Mr. Anderson. Then we have the Gauntlet Battle Royal, the winner getting supposedly a hundred thousand dollars. It was a Royal Rumble with forty five second intervals. They claimed forty five seconds. It varied from ten seconds to at one point I think about five minutes. No. They were well, here's the problem. They were forty five seconds, but for example, Angle and Anderson started. They had just barely started wrestling when Jeff Hardy's music played. Jeff Hardy took 30 seconds to get to the ring. Yes. So by the time they shut off his music, there were 15 seconds before the music hit again for AJ Styles. Then they went to commercial, and when they came back, four additional men were in the ring, and one was showing up. And long story short, this was so stupid to do <laughs> intervals. You should have just put all the fucking guys in the ring and had a 20-minute battle royal. It was so. actually hysterical because... Anderson and, Ang- Anderson and Angle were one and two, and Hardy was three. This is the pay-per-view main event. And they noted it. This is not random. Yeah. They're not trying to bullshit you. say, oh, look, oh, what are the fucking odds? No, they admitted this is thrown together by TNA management to stir the pot. Mm-hmm. So it was supposed to be the pay-per-view main event preview, and we got 10 to 15 seconds of actual action. <laughs> yeah. 10 to 15 seconds. So, yes, then we came back, like four guys were in there. The deal was... They got up to 14 dudes. There had not been any eliminations. Then there was a commercial break. And then we came back for, back for commercial, and number 19 came out. And who was number 19? Of, Why? All, of all the human beings <laughs> on the planet Earth, think of the stupidest person yeah. to have in this battle royal. The monster abyss. Yes. They're go- they have already signed his termination papers. They... Only have not fired him right now because his opponent begged for it and threatened to quit himself. If but he did not get a match at the pay-per-view. At the pay-per-view. He didn't say anything about not firing the guy. He just wants his pay-per-view match. Yes. They had no choice but to leave him in this match wherein he could win $100,000 of their money. Yeah. <laughs> so he gets in there. It was so fucking stupid. This is like the stupidest thing TNA's ever done. No. Why was this in the Battle Royal? Find me a good explanation for why Abyss was in the Battle Royal. Vince, lie to me. Vince, I find Abyss being in the Battle Royal less stupid than Abyss not being fired after he fucking killed the world champion with a board covered in nails. He didn't kill anybody on this show. He merely scared a woman. So, I find it far less ridiculous that he was allowed in this battle royal. Don't get me wrong, this was fucking stupid. But this was less ridiculous than when he tried to kill the world heavyweight champion with a bat covered in nails, and he was not fired. That was much stupider. I'm not sure I agree. But what can you do? So then Kevin Nash came out, and when you talked earlier about how excited, how much excitement Kevin Nash does not have, Kevin Nash came out in, like, blue sneakers, blue jeans, and a plain black T-shirt that he probably got for five dollars at Walmart. Kevin Nash does not give a shit. No, and he's still getting paid huge money. He's still making a lot of money. Amazing man. He came out, and then the best thing was Abyss, as I noted, ran in. Oh, I didn't note this. Not only was Abyss in the battle royal, they put him over. <laughs> he started tossing guys left and right. Yeah. So then Nash gets in there, and Kevin Nash begins to work Abyss over. Mm-hmm. Because you see, he's big. Yeah. So. Abyss continued to eliminate pretty much everyone. And then, after no one had come in for like five minutes, it seemed, Rob Van Dam entered. And he attacked Abyss, and he threw a high cross body that the idea was it would eliminate them both. He went right over. It took Abyss a few tries, and the camera actually missed it. Thank he was God. just on the floor all of a sudden. So, yes. I love the explanation that, that Dixie had offered RVD an open invite. So... Even though he's a babyface, he waited until almost everybody was eliminated, and then he came in. Yeah. Yeah. So came down to Angle and Anderson. Now, yeah, so now, uh, that, they, they were the, the last four, RVD and Abyss and Angle and Anderson. And so Rob Van Dam eliminates himself and Abyss, and then we're watching the screen, and the screen is showing what's happening in the ring. Anderson and Angle are trading punches from their knees. Then the announcers tell us, off camera, Abyss and Rob Van Dam are fighting to the back. That's a TNA thing right there. They couldn't just have Anderson and Angle doing a double down as Abyss and Rob Van Dam fought to the back. No, everything has to be going on at once. 
So they had their battle royal with the two guys left, and at the end of it, Angle hit an Angle slam to Anderson over the top rope to the floor, and he won the money, and the show ended. It was the same bullshit, actually. It entered ten minutes earlier, but they made us stick around to watch the first uh, ten minutes of, of reaction, which, you know, if I were ever going to watch reaction, the idea that they forced me to watch it by making this fucking show go ten minutes over makes me not want to ever watch it. And apparently Ric Flair did a drunken promo on that show, which was better than anything on Impact. Which, of course, as usual, begs the question, well, why the fuck wasn't on Impact then? All this great stuff. So anyway, they, uh, Angle won, show went off the air. That was your go-home for 10-10-10. I've seen worse. <laughs> it was an episode of Impact, In fact, everybody. most go-home shows for Impact are significantly worse than this one, so I will give this show a thumbs in the middle, leaning upwards, in fact. But, uh, and that's, that's grading on a TNA curve, everyone. To the back! Well, I guess we got to talk about this thing here. Well, I'm sure everybody's well aware by now. This was the show that Jay Wow was on. And as uh, as I noted this afternoon, if you went onto the board, they did not, in fact, move Jay Wow to hour one. They put her in hour two head to head with the real Jersey Shore. Yeah. And, and they had Shore come out and alert us that the real Jersey Shore was on the other channel right now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm making this up. I'm not. He came on TV and let us know that if we turned in to see Jay Wow, we should turn to the other channel immediately. Yeah. This show went an hour and 15 minutes before we got an actual wrestling match. Mm-hmm. It, and it's actually even worse than that. I, I, I tallied it all. In the two hours, the first two hours of Impact, because there was no room, but the first two hours of Impact was a total of six Minutes mm-hmm. of professional wrestling. Mm-hmm. They had one match in the first hour that went zero minutes, and a match that went two minutes, then a match that went four minutes. Mm-hmm. Then the main event started technically after the two hours had expired. Yeah. And uh, in between was every promo and every storyline ever. As you pointed out, it was two months of programming in one show, two yeah. months of storyline in one show. I mean, seriously, they couldn't have stretched this out over a month. They could have stretched this out till 2011. They could not have stretched this. They could not have stretched all of this out and led to, say, a uh, RVD versus Mr. Anderson match at the next pay per view, where uh, the winner would get whoever the champion is right now. I don't even know oh, Jeff fucking Hardy at the next pay per view. I mean, they really couldn't have done that. The thing is, it's not like so these are not bad promos. None of these segments individually was actually ter- was uh, they were all the individual segments were pretty much okay. It's just they all added up to nothing, complete nothing. And let me let me say this: I am sick of this reaction bullshit. I'm sure that reaction is a great show. Somebody pointed out to me that all that preview stuff that I loved leading up to the pay per view, the half hour pre show, which I thought was great, was all stuff from reaction. Listen to me. I will not watch three hours of impact. I'm not the only one. I get the ratings every week. Last week, if you add in DVR viewership, impact did 1.9 million viewers. You know how many viewers watched Reaction? Nine. 800,000. May, may have been slightly over 8. Maybe we could round it up to 9. That's Reg- still less than half. Yes. Regardless, 1 million people who watched 2 hours of Impact had no desire to watch a third hour. I'm among those people. <laughs> and this is what I'm going to do every week, and this is not going to change. I'm going to set my DVR 10 minutes long. In fact, it's always been set 10 minutes long. If Impact goes past 2 hours and 10 minutes, that's it for the evening. I'm not watching a single minute more. It pains me to watch 10 minutes more. But I will do that. I will watch an extra 10 minutes of Impact as it leaks onto reaction. But I'm not going to watch another second of it. Now, the thing that really pisses me off about this is... And I'm, gonna, I'm actually, I've requested the quarter hours for reaction, because I don't get them. 
I only get the hourly number in the viewership, which, as noted, is about 800,000 viewers out of the 1.9 million that watch if you add in DVRs. So I am going to get the quarters, and I'm going to see, I'm going to see if they actually retain their audience at the 11 to 11.15 mark. Are people, are, when, when Impact goes off the air and they tell us to stay tuned for reaction, are people really still watching? Because if they are, that would mean that the remaining three quarters of reaction are probably significantly lower than 800,000 viewers in order to get the average of 800,000. So i got to see what the answer to this is. But it's one thing when Raw does an overrun and they add a million viewers. You know what I mean? Like, Raw is averaging 4.5 million viewers for the second hour, and they go eight minutes long, and during that eight minutes they get a million new people tuning in. That's one thing. When that's the case, then the overrun is worth it. When your overrun plunges a million viewers, it's not worth it to go past the top of the hour. If a million of your fans have had enough after two hours, then all of these angles and matches and such that you're shooting that go 15 minutes past the top of the two-hour mark, no one's watching them. So why would you do them? That would mean that only the hardest of the hardcore are seeing your most important angles. That's stupid. Your big angles should be viewed by the maximum amount of viewers. So anyway, I'm going to get the quarters. I'll find out. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe 3 million people are watching that first quarter of impact or reaction. I find that hard to believe given the overall number. It does not make sense, but perhaps that's the case. So I will hold off judgment until I see the quarter hours for impact. If the the top of the hour reaction numbers are any lower than the two hour impact numbers, then they're goddamn idiots for going past the top of the two hours. And and based on the overall number of of, uh, reaction, I would guess that they're goddamn idiots. Now, not to mention last week when they went over the top of the hour for the go home show, that all of the people that watch impact in the UK they don't have a reaction. And so when Impact went off the air in the U.K. and they said stay tuned for reaction, the show just went off the air. So all of those people in the U.K. never actually saw the end of the main event on Impact. That was great. The show opened up with storyline. They showed clips of the pay-per-view, which I did not see. I read about I watched these clips, and all I could think was, this seems like a very complicated way for five men to get the championship on Jeff Hardy. I'm already exhausted, by the way. <laughs> I am just, this show completely drained me of life by the end. I was doing okay literally for about 50 minutes. I didn't even hate the show for about 50 minutes, even though it was all talk. I did not hate it for about 50 minutes. I was giving it a chance. But after about the 50-minute mark, when they kept fucking talking... And shooting fucking angles. Actually, when I really lost it was the segment backstage with Hogan and Dixie. And and we'll get into that in just a moment. But first off, the show opens with a storyline. Dixie's attorney is there. Now, I presume this must be her real attorney. <laughs> That's exactly because what Because this I fucking thought. guy this could the not worst actor act a lick. Ever. He must be a professional law person. They couldn't get it. An actor, I guess not at, to work for a hundred dollars. I guess there was no one available at Universal Studios to get a, make a television appearance. So this horrible actor comes out. He's Dixie's attorney. He explains to Bischoff that Bischoff had Dixie sign a contract under false pretenses. They did not explain what the contract was. They presumed we all knew. And by the way, this was what everybody figured going in. But they did not explain it here in this segment. So this guy makes a very valid legal argument that Dixie thought she was signing something else, so it did not count. Bischoff, who is not an attorney, argued no. She signed this contract on national TV in front of millions of viewers. This argument would actually help Dixie Carter. Yes. Millions yes. of people on television saw her sign something under false pretenses. Yes. He, he claimed there were millions of witnesses. So, as, even, as Todd Martin pointed out, there are millions of witnesses to his fraud. Even 
I know this, but Dixie's attorney felt checkmated. He said, well, Eric, I'll see you later. And off he went. I cannot wait to see how they explain this in the long term. Now, again, fine. Pro wrestling is fake. It's bullshit. We have to suspend our disbelief. As fucking stupid as this was, I'm going to go with it for now. There are bigger fish to fry on this particular show. So, <laughs> that's true. Out comes the fish. The fish. Well, first off, after this segment was over and the announcers open up the show, then they announce that Dixie has signed over the majority of her shares to Eric, so he is no longer president. This is fraud on a massive scale. <laughs> but again, I'm going to go with this. So, out comes Hogan and Eric. They got a fair amount of heat. I thought the crowd was overwhelmingly approving of Hulk Hogan. May have been. They love this evil man, or who was supposed to be evil, I guess. It's still hard to tell sometimes. He explained that, and this is the irony of ironies, by the way. Dixie on her Twitter after the show, she actually said this. You can look it up. She said, Hogan and Eric had killed one company, and they weren't going to kill hers. What? I swear to God she said this. Yeah. <laughs> this is not awesome. <laughs> this is why I was loving this show. You know, I, I, I just was in love with the show at this point. Because at this point, I still did not give a fuck. You know? It's just like, okay, show's stupid. All of this is dumb. But fine. I really don't care. So, Hogan said Dixie conned him about coming in. She wouldn't listen to anybody's his ideas. So he grabbed everything. He took what was promised to him, he said. Yeah. So, he also announced that the company will live forever. Yeah. He has saved the company, everyone. He painted himself as the hero, and he got applause. He said this wasn't just a hostile takeover. It was a work of art. He said Monet would never have come up with something like this. No shit. I last like when uh, Eric said that nobody saw this coming. Yeah. Whereas, in fact, I always love that line. Nobody saw something coming that made absolutely no fucking sense. Well, well, Is there something to cheer? Whereas, in fact... We all predicted it would be Eric and Hogan as heels before they even appeared on Impact. If if you... I don't know. He, he did, in fact, say that when Abyss turned heel, everyone said, this makes no sense. And his excuse was, it made sense to us. Because Abyss was working for Hulk the entire time. I just think, like, if you did King of the Mountain and there's those four boxes and three boxes are open and the last box has to have the world championship and someone opens a box and there's, like, a giant dildo in there and they said, ha-ha, we fooled you! This is, like, a win somehow. Nobody saw that coming. No one saw it coming, so it is a win. So they talked about this and that and the other thing. And Abyss came out, talked about the sheep, how nobody saw this coming. Actually, everyone saw this coming, except for the Jeff Hardy thing. And next they called out Jarrett. He ranted. This was spectacular. Yeah. Ranted Jarrett? about how Dixie took a company he founded right out from underneath his nose using her daddy's money. Never mind the fact that Jarrett used his daddy's money, and they burned through the money so fast that had Dixie not used her daddy's money, there would be no impact right yes. now. Yes. She used her daddy's money to take, take over the company, and where did that money go? Isn't that into Jeff Jarrett's pockets? Yeah. Who he's mad at himself. For selling to Dixie. Yeah. Or mad at Dixie for buying his stuff. Again, who cares? So, Fortune is out next. Flair cuts a promo. Tease is turning on Hogan. And then basically says, either you leave TNA Hogan or I do. And then they hug. They just wanted to swerve the fans. Yeah, and somebody was yelling sucker in the background repeatedly, like we'd all been fooled. Because, again, yes, we are suckers for not seeing another stupid swerve. Flair was going, uh, said he was going to wake up every day and love Hulk more than anything he'd ever loved, including his five ex-wives, who he said could kiss his ass on national television. Finally out came Jeff Hardy. Fans chanted, you sold out. He said, I didn't sell out, I sold in. He blamed the fans for his anger and his pain. Said he had herniated discs and pinched nerves because of the fans. No, Jeff, if this were real, that's your fault. <laughs> you did not have to do all of these stupid fucking things. So, he said RVD was an asshole. He was just another politician. 
There were people chanting Hardy. That was good. Yeah. And there, there, there was actually a great positive here where he explained that he sicked Abyss on Rob Van Dam because he had to be eliminated. So this was, he did not use his exact words, but he did say that he could not beat RVD one on one. So that's a cowardly heel thing to do. So that's a thumbs up. So then Nash and Sting are watching backstage. Bischoff invites them down. After commercial, out they come. We get Mike Tanay being all exasperated, and he you, says... You missed something here when they, when they came back for commercial. A frightened Dixie Carter arrived at the building, accompanied with Gunner and Murphy. Don't care. So today said, these guys have been trying to tell the world what was going on for months, but, and this is a direct quote, damn it, nobody would listen. Mm-hmm. Dixie actually had a great line later in the show when she said, you guys were speaking in tongues. Yes. This is, in fact, true. Yes, we were not listening because they never said anything. So Mike Tanay here who's saying, damn it, no one who would listen. This is the same Mike Tanay who last week admitted he had no idea what they were talking about. Right. So, Meanwhile, the, 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 you know, nobody would listen. They did not say, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff and Jeff Hardy are going to screw Kurt Angle. And not only did they not come out and say it, but they didn't do anything to stop it. No, of course not. They just... I don't know what they did. I don't know what they did. So then we had Nash cutting a promo, which may be one of his last promos before he leaves TNA after beating Joe at the pay-per-view. Talking about how it used to be all about the money. And by the way, another great irony. It used to be all about the money, he says, but no more. I'm here for the young guys. Now I'm leaving, he says. And he really is. Presumably, he may have re-signed, and this is some goofy work that no one could possibly care about. Then Sting said the same thing. He loved TNA. This was a no-win situation. He wasn't going to repeat history again. The answer was no. They walked away. People clapped. That was segment one. It went like a half hour. They cut to the back. Pope is back there. He is talking to Kevin Nash and Sting. This was where I started to get pissed off. This was very, very awful. The camera is like... 15 feet behind them. The only one facing us is the Pope. Kevin Nash and Sting have their back to us. Of course, it's supposed to be raw, gritty footage, so there are no mics, which means you can hear the Pope, you can barely hear Kevin Nash, you could probably not hear Sting at all if he even spoke. I missed, like, 80% of what they were talking about. The loudest noise here by far was the crowd reaction inside the, the, the ringside area. Then, the next noticeable noise was a, uh, just a hum. Mm -hmm. Cannot identify this hum. There was a hum. Then there was a big drop-off, and then the next loudest noise was the Pope, who I could hear what the Pope was saying. Then, I could hear that Nash was speaking. I could not make out much of what he said, and Sting, I don't think I heard anything he said the entire time. So, they left on good terms. Pope said he was staying to fight the fight, but they shook hands and he wished them well. Then Pope left, and then Dixie arrived. And Dixie was much quieter than Pope, and here's where I could barely hear anything at all. They may as well have been speaking French. She went nuts. She ran into Hogan and Eric and slapped them. She demanded Hogan look at her in the eye and tell her he screwed her. Does she really need that? It's obvious. He said if you wanted to have this conversation, they could have it in his office, which, thank God, was miked. So after commercial, we got the big meeting. She was screaming at Hogan and Eric. At one point, she said, and I quote, God dang it. Later, she called Eric Bischoff a shit, which was not bleeped off television. Hogan said, yes, I screwed you. She wanted to know why. He said, I don't know what he said. I know. All I know is everybody, as usual on Impact, everybody was screaming back and forth, mm-hmm. talking over each other, bitching. Long story short, she was mad. Hogan and Eric said it was their company now. She tried to have Gunner and Murphy, the most annoying characters in the history of television. And it's nothing against Gunner and Murphy. It's the fact that Gunner and Murphy exist. And they're mentioned by name, two people like we're supposed to care at all who these people are. They are commanded to take Hogan and Bischoff away, but instead they take her away. Because you see, they work for Hogan and Eric now. And as they're going away, there's a scuffle, and in the middle of it, Surge went down. I thought it was Sarge. Who is Surge, you ask? I did. In fact, ask, who is that guy? That is Dixie's husband. He's been on one show. 
It was a show that I missed. I believe he was beaten up on that one, too. Yes, and the point I'm trying to make here is I missed that show, and when I tuned in the next week, there was not a single mention, a single clip, a single recap of what happened to Surge. So I never got to see Surge get beat up or even clips of it because they never bothered to show us a replay. Of course not. Surge apparently really got punched in the face, by the way. I'm fine with that. And he went down, and again... This was the last we saw of Surge. Perhaps he was killed. Perhaps he died. All I know is that Hulk and Dixie were shouting at each other the entire time, and I could not, for the life of me, understand a point that either of them was trying to make. All I know is that through body language and voice inflection, there was no way a person could watch this and not feel bad for Hulk and hate Dixie Carter. He came off like a victim, and she came off like a terror. At this point... At this point, I was wondering, okay, so I realize that you, you stole the company under false pretenses, massive fraud, but what about, like, assaulting innocent people? Couldn't Surge just, like, sue Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff for everything they've got and get the company back that way? I don't know. I thought about that for two seconds, by the way. I don't know. Which is way more thought than they put into this. At this point, the camera cut outside, a car pulled up, a female stepped out and walked into the building... That was it. Now, we've established earlier that I am old. And if you've listened to the show for any length of time, you know I am not cool. Apparently, this was Jay Wow from the Jersey Shore. I didn't know who she was. I was not told who she was. I was just bewildered. I thought perhaps it was part of a commercial that accidentally aired during Impact. No, that was her appearance. She walked in anonymously. If you do not watch Jersey Shore, and I know a lot of people do, but I know a lot of people also don't, then you had no idea who this was. Then the announcer started talking. Someone here, they mentioned Jay Wow, and I realized, oh, that must have been her. I loved how the announcers are talking about all of this insanity that is taking place backstage with Dixie, Hogan, and Bischoff. And then they offhandedly, today mentions, and Jay Wow from Jersey Shore has just shown up. That was, like, literally the extent of it. This is a terrible television show. They weren't, like, wondering, why is Jay Wow here? Wait a second. Jay Wow from Jersey Shore is here? What the fuck? Do you know who that was? Nope. They were just like, Jay Wow has shown up backstage. All right. Okay. So, Madison came out with a ref. Said Tara had spoiled her plans at the pay-per-view to become a three-time champion. She said Tara had her to thank... For having her job back in TNA. You're already talking too much about this. Called her out, demanded she lay down so she could win her title back. Tara did it. Madison celebrated like she'd won the WrestleMania main event. This was our first match on Impact. It started at 50 minutes past the hour. It ended at 50 minutes past the hour. Yeah. Out came Mickey. Said this was disgraceful. There was a lot of talking. Mickey told Madison... Madison told Tara to get Mickey. That failed. And then Madison bailed and ran for her life. And then Mickey just celebrated with the championship. <laughs> not like the old days where you never touched the title until you won it. Of course not. That's what you paid for was to see the baby face with the belt in their hands. Mm-hmm. No, nope, now the now the belt gets stolen all the time, actually. So who gives a fuck? All I know is, and here's another thumbs up for this evening, Mickey James looked unreal on the show. Yeah. She was beautiful. Jay, well, speaking of, met with the beautiful people who were, of course, as they are every week, having makeup applied. Because you see, they're not really pretty, everybody. They have to spend the entire show having mounds of makeup caked onto their faces. That is a story of impact. She said she was looking for, quote, a bitch named Cookie. So after commercial, they were looking for her. Eric Young showed up, was acting like an idiot. Jay Wow said, and I quote, in our big rub for the evening, who is this guy? This segment was hideous. So... And it was during this segment, by the way, that the real Jersey Shore, a brand new episode, began oh, fantastic. on MTV. So, yes, uh, the, the, the did not accept Orlando's gift of a lollipop. They walked down the hallway, and Orlando said, Jersey Shore sucks. Mm-hmm. Flying celebrity appearance. Kurt Angle came out. Yeah. More talking. <laughs> More everyone. talking. From, from a guy who announced that, well, he retired on the last show. He said he was going to keep his word. That uh, he was going to retire, but he wanted to know why he was screwed. He started talking about this how... This is where I lost it, by the way. I, that's totally fair. There was, like, so much talking. <laughs> there was so much stuff to recap. There was so much stuff to report See, on. That's why I stopped with the details. I just... I, I did, too. This was where I just began to quit. <laughs> yes. 
I know that Jeff Jarrett came out. I know he meant something about fucking Kurt's wife or something like that. I know this made Kurt mad. I know that Gunner and Murphy beat up Kurt. And then I know that Taz came out of the booth, and the announcer, who was never going to wrestle a match, made Jeff Jarrett stop. Mm-hmm. Now, now, granted, Taz is an awesome, he plays a badass better than anyone. Yeah. But he's an announcer. He has a fat old announcer. He's never going to wrestle again. Uh-huh. He ran off Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. And we had Gunner and fucking Murphy <laughs> again. Murphy were there again. Why are Gunner and Murphy not the tag champs? They're, they're like a, the, the unstoppable duo. Yeah, they're, they're like pushed above everyone else on this show. Gunner and Murphy. What is a Gunner and what is a Murphy? They're badasses, apparently. Yeah, what is, what's Gunner's last name? Smith? Er. What's Murphy's last name? E, Bed? Murph E and Gun R. That's the names. Sucked. Uh, there's a line in here where... Jared, one hour and ten fucking minutes without a wrestling match at this point. Yes, Jarrett uh, was talking about how he had he had screwed Kurt in part because Kurt had driven him crazy when he first came to TNA. You know, back when Kurt was evil and Jeff was good. So it's always good when the heel is actually justified in his anger. So, th- they talked for, seriously, about four minutes. I have no idea what most of it was. Then, they did a commercial. Then they came back in, replayed it. Yeah. So, they don't do replays of what happened last week, but they do the replays of what happened two minutes ago. Speaking of, Samoa Joe was at the beach. And there he was. I just thought he was walking down the street somewhere. Yeah, they put up I sign. have <laughs> no idea what he said, so I hope you wrote it down. Of course not. <laughs> he was <laughs> mad about something. <laughs> he he was beach. surly. Well, I actually remember, this one actually, as far as promos in this show go, this was coherent. He was upset partly at himself for putting his faith in Jarrett, but even more upset with Jarrett for uh, you know stabbing him in the back of the pay per view. He said he was looking for Jarrett. That was it. He so, was looking for Jarrett at the beach. I guess so. But Jeff wasn't there. Earth so. to Samoa Joe. <laughs> Just wait around at the fucking impact zone. He'll show up eventually. So, after not finding Jeff Jarrett at the beach, Samoa Joe wrestled a match. Samoa Joe versus Abyss. The bell to start this match began at 1.16. One hour and 16 minutes from the top of the show. It went two minutes. Two minutes later, Abyss grabbed the ring bell right in front of the, dis- the referee and hit Joe with it for the disqualification. I'm not going to bitch, though, because at least we finally got rules. It is ironic that it would happen in a match with Abyss, who never follows the rules. Of course. So he busts Joe open with the bell. He's beating him up back in, inside the ring when Rob Van Dam comes out to make the save. So apparently Rob Van Dam, after beating Abyss on the pay-per-view, is now going to do a feud with him. Of course. You, you, you do the blow-off match first, and then you build the feud. Of course, yes. So Abyss fled. You're missing the best part of this entire segment was another line by the great Mike Tanay. Who said, I swear to God, this is an exact quote. There are bad feelings between Abyss and Rob Van Dam. You don't say. <laughs> bad Abyss tried to kill him with a bat covered in nails. And there are now bad feelings between the two men. Yeah. Yes. So. Rob Van Dam, since he was out there anyway, decided to call out Jeff Hardy. Of course. More fucking talk. More time to talk. No more of this. That's two minutes of wrestling. That's enough of that. This was must... where I realized this could have been a month's worth of programming. Easy. We must talk more. So he calls out Jeff, and Jeff Hardy answers via a pre-taped video. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pre-taped. Which among, is amazing. Among, among Jeff Hardy's many strengths, speaking of pre-taped videos is not on them. He, he philosophized. Was, he, in a very boring manner. Yeah. He said friendship was an illusion. He said some were calling him the new antichrist of professional wrestling. Name one person. I actually would like to make a prediction by, right here, by the way. I predict that the hour and 15 minute mark is when the massive turnout of viewers occurs on this show. Because this was like where I completely, <laughs> like, completely gave up on this show. Huh. Like, I, I made it all the way, I made it all the way to, to Kurt Angle and Jeff yelling back and forth at each other. That was getting on my nerves. But when when, when we had a two-minute match and then another ten minutes of fucking talking, mm-hmm. that's where it was just like, I am done. Okay, so let's, let's review what we just saw since the last commercial break. Samoa Joe cut a promo from the beach. Abyss wrestled Joe for two minutes. <laughs> Abyss beat up Joe. RVD saved. RVD called out Jeff. Jeff cut a pre tape promo. The thing ended, and then Eric Bischoff came out. This is all one segment. Yes. And Mike Tanay, here's where I put it, Mike Tanay. He said, now what? (laughs) 
Eric Bischoff came out and he booked Rob Van Dam versus Mr. Anderson for the main event of the show with the winner to get a title shot at the next pay per view. Yeah. Fine. Then we got something amazing. Oh my God. Bischoff had a lewd meeting with Miss Tessmacher. His first sentence to her was that he liked her pearl necklace. Yeah. Not making this up. Which, by the way, was, was I think there may have been 5,000 pearls on this on this uh, 84 link necklace. Mm hmm. So they made plans. <laughs> this is what I wrote down. They make plans to fuck later. Yeah. And uh, after arranging time and perhaps payments, he then had the gall to accuse her of being a whore. Mm -hmm. He called her all sorts of names that got bleeped. He accused her of spilling secrets to Kevin Nash and the Pope that almost cost him everything. What were these secrets, and what did they almost cost you? I like he how he just now found out about this, by the way. Yes, that's true. You know what the best part of this was? No, I don't. I'll tell you. It's hard to tell what he called her because it was all bleeped out, but it appears he called her a bitch a number of times, and a whore, and probably a slut, and every terrible name you could call a woman. I bet Skank was in there. And she stood there the entire time, and finally, finally, what set her off and caused her to run off weeping was when he told her to get her 38 double Ds out of there. Because, you see, she doesn't care about being called a slut or a whore or a bitch. But when she points out that her breasts are a size 38 double D, she can take no more. What? That was not my favorite part. My favorite part was right as she's leaving, he explains to her that she's fired as his secretary and whatever other services she may have been providing. He explains to her that oh she, my will, God. she will have to <laughs> he just remembered. She will have to get a pair of boots and a pair of tights and she will have to go wrestle. Now I will bet you I won't say a million dollars because someone will cause me to pay up, but I'll bet you ten dollars that they make her that they put her in a pair of baggy pants. <laughs> I think uh, a, a long, fluffy dress. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, they will find some way to completely cover her best asset, which what? is, in fact, her ass, when she does uh, this match. A bustle? Is that what the women used to wear? <laughs> that she'd look good in a bustle, but... Okay, but, yeah, uh, yes. So he explained to her that to have a job, she's going to have to go wrestle. And, and this is a quote that in a million years I can never make up, but it's what Eric Bischoff said. Because that's all you are good for. <laughs> And that's when I decided this was the ultimate wrestling show for people who hate wrestling. Because you see, she was being demoted from prostitute to pro wrestler. Yeah. This is a terrible, terrible insult. By the way, this was... I'm not making this up, everyone. This was I'm not even really loosely interpreting it. <laughs> that's what the man said. This was where I had to check to see how many words I'd written so far about this show. 2034. <laughs> See, I actually took much sparser notes than usual. And I, I was not trying care. to pad it. I was merely writing everything that happened on the show. Complete, overwritten bullshit this show was. Yes, so then Mr. Anderson, same segment, showed up to uh, annoy Eric. No idea what they were talking about. He I gave up. called him an asshole and a douchebag, and he grabbed his hand for a handshake, and Eric was selling it like it was caught in the jaws of life. So now Mr. Anderson, who... Never really thought of him as a powerhouse, but apparently he has a killer handshake of death. Mm -hmm. All right, good to know. We have the Pope and Fortune in a five-on-one match. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> this match started an hour and 33 minutes into Impact. Up to this point, we had seen two matches totaling two minutes. We think on this match, it went four minutes. Yeah. It and was now? actually a pretty good match. Especially when Pope made a big comeback at the end and ran wild on everybody. The action was very, very good. Sure. With that said, what? the idea that Pope was competitive with five members yeah. of your top heel group <laughs> and almost won by himself yeah. made them look like idiots. Yeah. Oh, well, who cares? Who cares? So, yes, three matches. When it combined six minutes, we were an hour and 37 minutes in the show, and that was all we saw for a long time. So then, head-to-head -head with Shore on MTV, a brand-new episode of Jersey Shore. I will say, and believe me, there's no way TNA could have planned this. This was a complete coincidence. But the entire segment with Jay Wow actually took place during a commercial break on Jersey Shore. 
Which, by the way, should also tell you how long this fucking yes. segment was. And how long the commercial, well, also how long the commercial breaks in Jersey Shore are. The $15,000 segment opened up with Shore coming out. And keep in mind, by the way, they debuted on Impact yes. last week. Yes, they, this was their third appearance, and we are already supposed to only be Only so their second in front of a major crowd. Well, only the second time I've seen them. And, uh, yes, this is, we're already supposed to be so sick of them, we can't wait for the real Jersey Shore people to kick their ass. No. Fail. They come out. Serious go away heat. People are chanting boring. Cookie buries Jay Wow, and what a coincidence, out she came. Cookie told her to take her fake weave, her fake nails, her fake boobs, crawl back into the hole she came out of, called her a bitch, of course, slapped her. Jay Wow tackled her. They had a cat fight. Suddenly, Robbie E is down. We rewound it. There was no explanation for this. The best we can come up with, based on the announcers, is that it appears he probably was kicked in the balls. But we have absolutely no idea. So, the timing was horrible. The camera missed it. Jay Wow then beats up Cookie, tosses her outside. That was the end of the segment. That was the entire thing. Yeah. $15,000 appearance fee for that. I will say this. It was a million times better than Jenna versus Charmel. Sure. It was. Great. So, they did a commercial. I'm going to pay $15,000 to have something better than Charmel versus Jenna Maraska. I will accept your money. May as well just go out of business now. All right. They replayed the deal. And then we had the main event of Rob Van Dam versus Miss, Mr. Anderson. The bill rang exactly two hours in. So, yes, in the technically two hours the impact was on, six minutes of wrestling. Again, my DVR was set for ten minutes over. Mm-hmm. All I know about this match is that RVD made a big comeback and tripped right over Mr. Anderson. You, you can't even... You're not burying them enough for this. These guys, as far as pro wrestlers go, are both pretty clumsy. Rob's running wild. They're, they're, Anderson had heat on him, but they were both faces. The crowd didn't want to boo Anderson. This was a dream match, Vinny. In terms of like putting two guys in the ring to just have a dream match for me. <laughs> Rob Van Dam and Mr. Anderson... There's, if they wrestled a hundred times, they would blow something every single time. Yes. And this one, Rob's throwing these clotheslines. He throws a clothesline, and Anderson takes a bump. He throws a clothesline, and Anderson takes a bump. He throws a third, Anderson takes a bump right in front of Rob. <laughs> and Rob then trips over him and falls into the ropes. I could, I could, I, I, I mean, want to say I could not believe this. <laughs> I couldn't believe this, but at the same time, I was like, well, duh. I, I, if you don't see the show... I understand this explanation makes no sense, because when you... How could you clothesline someone and have them bump in front of you? That makes no sense. Your arm's off to the side. That's where they should be. And you're running past them. How do they somehow get in front of you? These two men found a way. So, Bischoff came out. Bischoff came out and, and took the ref. Literally. Yeah, when we say took the ref, we don't mean got his attention. No. He grabbed the referee. He said, come here, young man. And uh, the referee... He spirited him away. <laughs> he is not coerced. He was not bullied. He was not grabbed. He was not persuaded. He just went where Mr. Bischoff told him to. And they left. He took him to Oz. <laughs> sure. And all that... It's just like... It was It was actually perfect. He... They were having... A, there was a wrestling match going on. It was, in fact, as Taz pointed out, a number one contender's wrestling match. There was a it number was one... It was theoretically very important. There was a number one contender's match going on. Eric Bischoff came out, he said, referee, come here. He took the referee away, and they got a long shot, and there's two wrestlers down in the ring, there's no referee, and there's fans just watching the action, and that's when my DVR cut out. And you know what? I don't care. In fact, I'm not even going to go out of my way to find out what happened, because I'm going to do an experiment. Okay. I am going to wait until next week's show. And I'm going to see if they show me what happened here. I'm going to see if they show me what happened at the end of the number one contenders match. I would bet that they do not. I would bet that next week when I turn on the show, they will recap everything except the result of the number one contenders match. This is a horrible, horrible wrestling show. This is a horrible television show. It's a horrible television show that used to be about wrestling. Dixie, listen to me. Hello? The man who is writing your show doesn't like wrestling. He doesn't want to be a wrestling booker. He wants to write awful television shows. 
That is so, the, the first hour and 15 minutes of the show, it was so patently obvious. He doesn't care about wrestling at all. He is being given an opportunity to write a shitty, I don't even know if you can call it a sitcom, I don't know what you'd call it, an action-adventure television program. He is, you are paying him, a man who hates this business, to write a god-awful television show every single week. Why are you doing this? I would like an explanation. Actually, I don't really care, to be honest with everybody. To the back! We watched Impact tonight, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I was, uh, I was ready to unleash a, a tirade and officially boycott this show through uh, Final Resolution or whatever the, the next fucking pay-per-view is called. I forget. Long story short, there was a match that involved Mr. Anderson in the end. Ultimate X match with Kazarian. And uh, I'd actually gotten a text from Dave. I, I, of course, have to watch this on the West Coast feed. And Dave watches the East Coast feed because he can. He can and I can't. The point is, he sent me a text and it just said, wait until you see the chair shot at the end of Impact. And, like, I started to sweat just reading it. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. It's fucking... It's, it's almost October, 2011. It's October of 2010. And and you're telling me that there's a, a chair shot of doom on this goddamn show? I mean, you, you you seriously, this has to be a joke. Dave doesn't joke around. So, when Mr. Anderson was standing in the ring and Jeff Hardy entered with a chair, I almost just wanted to shut it off right now because I knew trouble was coming. I thought that Jeff was going to rear back and and make a, like, a Bigfoot plaster cast of... Mr. Anderson's head in the steel chair. What actually happened was, Jeff swung the chair, it hit Anderson in the back of the head, Anderson went down and said, and I quote, fuck! And covered the back of his head, and moments later, covered in blood. Just covered in blood. Deep gash, bleeding all over the place. And I went back and rewound it a couple of times, and Jeff Hardy screwed up. This was not an intentional chair shot to the back of the head. He tried to hit him in the back, and I don't know what happened, but the very edge of the chair was a little high, and it clipped Mr. Anderson in the back of the head. I I know that that people like to think that there's some sort of gimmick, that I'm biased against TNA, and that I, I always look for the worst and that sort of thing, but let's be fair, this was not done on purpose. It was no. a it was a different kind of stupidity. It was careless stupidity as opposed to indifferent stupidity. Yes, Jeff it Hardy. Actually, Jeff Hardy messed up. I just realized this. It was exactly what a young man named Matt Hardy once did to a fellow named Brock Lesnar. Yeah, he was supposed to be a chair to the back. He lost control of the chair and swung it like an axe in the back of Brock's head. And then moments later, he had to wrestle Brock. And what is still one of the best moments of SmackDown history, <laughs> as as Brock paced back and forth, he was. Bleeding profusely, but seemed otherwise unhurt, and he was calmly, I, I call him the wrong word, he was intensely pacing in the ring, waiting for Matt to come to his doom. But he was not growling or snarling, he was seemed like a very reasonable human being who was about to perform an execution, and then Matt Hardy had to make his entrance, and you've never seen the wrestler piss himself down the aisle before. Yeah. It was great. Now, I will say, too, that I was once wrestling a tag match with Buddy Wayne and Richie Magnet, and the finish involved me drop kicking a chair into Richie Magnet's head. Now, all I had to do was was drop kick the chair and then uh I wasn't really kicking it into his head because you see it's fake. And I would drop kick the chair, he would bonk himself in the head with it from like, you know, 4 inches away. It's uh it's very safe actually, in theory. Except what happened was he I dropped kicked the chair, he he bonked himself in the head with it. He took a bump and the chair flew up in the air. And fell right back down and hit him right in the head. I see. And busted him open. Mm -hmm. And uh, I expected to die, to be quite honest with you. But he didn't kill me. And the the uh, the sad part was he was he was scheduled to uh, to accept an award for Napa Salesman of the Year in Las Vegas the next day. So he had to go to the emergency room, get stitched up, and then get on an airplane and go to Las Vegas. He didn't kill me. Never. You know, he didn't he didn't kill you the next time you saw him or any time after that. No. That's why I love Richie Mack. That's a great reason. The point is, act-
accidents happen in wrestling, even when you're trying to be safe. And that's what happened here, so I'm not going to blow my stack. Although, I will say, there was another chair shot earlier in the show involving Sabu and Rob Van Dam, which was somewhat hard, but was not a full-fledged, insane chair shot to the head. But still, Sabu does not need to be throwing chairs at guys' heads in 2010 anymore. Oh, the, the biggest thing to me is that Rob Van Dam, when taking a thrown chair to the head, does not need to leave his hands at his sides and lean his head into it. Yes, that was also very stupid. You can put your hands up. It's okay. And also, not only that, but when he did take the chair shot with his skull and fall down and get pinned, he stood up two seconds later and wasn't even selling it. So, stop with the fucking chairs, people. Jesus. Let's start with this show here. So, of course, last week the show went off the air very, very late. And if you read the news earlier this week, they lost over a half a million viewers from start to finish. So I didn't see the end of the show. I long since stopped caring, like uh, <laughs> half a million other people. And I figured, well, let's see if next week they tell us what happened there in the main event of the show in a number one contenders match for Jeff Hardy's title. What they did was they recapped the first half hour of the show, which was remarkable since that was the most watched Impact segment since January 4th. 2.1 million viewers watched that segment. That was what they felt it was very important to recap. Then they very briefly showed a clip of Jeff attacking Mr. Anderson and RVD, presumably at the end of the show, and Taz said Jeff ruined the match, and they cut away. Mike Tanay then explained that Jeff had injured both men in the main event, and that was the extent of the recap. So the bad news is that was a shitty recap. The good news is it was... Enough of a recap that I know what happened. So I give it a thumbs in the middle. You can see a passing grade. It's a passing grade. Anderson came out in a sling. Demanded Jeff come down. RVD came out instead. They bantered back and forth. Jeff appeared on the big screen, insincerely asking for forgiveness. Bischoff came out doing his 1990s WCW gimmick. And he asked us to watch reactions so we could learn how he and Hulk orchestrated this masterpiece. No. No, we did not watch it. We did not watch reaction. Nor are we going to. I'm not watching three hours of impact, everyone. I'm just not. And uh, and before anyone yells at me, no one else is either. The show finished at 8.5 last week. I don't want to be an answer for that. No. So he asked Anderson to forgive him. Said that he was going to uh, give him a match tonight with Kazarian. And you know, one of the things that pisses me off about Eric Bischoff is, how long has he been here? With TNA? Yeah. Uh, ten months? Ten months. Ten months, and he still doesn't seem to follow his own product. He said that, Anderson, I feel that I didn't challenge you enough in the past and, and give you the opportunities you needed. And so tonight, I'm going to show you how sincere I am by giving you a match with Kazarian. But not just any match, he said. It is going to be, and I quote, an X Division match. That's what he said. This is why I was so confused later. So, he only said that Anderson had to grab the X to get the title shot. So, I presumed it was either a ladder match or an Ultimate X match. As it turns out, it was an Ultimate X match. With a ladder. But Eric Bischoff did not even know the term Ultimate X. He just knew X Division. You've been here for ten months. So, he then signed RVD to a match with uh, Beer Money, with Sabu as his partner, and that was your opening segment. For those of you who, the first part of that, before Brian got into all the uh, stuff about Eric and, and recaps and stuff, the four entrances between Anderson and Hardy, and, uh, and uh, or excuse me, Anderson, RVD, Jess Video, and Eric, that all went in the course of a minute and a half. Mm-hmm. Just, just, guy came out, guy came out, video, Eric came out. And I talked for a very short time, and uh, the, the stuff about forgiveness and the X Division, it, it blew my mind. I was aware by the end of this that Anderson was booked against Kazarian, and, and Anderson, by the way, had just a ridiculous amount of it. He was, he was wearing a sling, and his shoulder was taped up. He was completely immobile, so he was going to a wrestling match tonight. That was absurd on the surface, and it got funnier when I realized what the match was later. And yes, he also booked RVD and Sabu against Beer Money. You know what's infuriating about this show, one of many things, is, again, we've mentioned this many times, it's called Impact, yet nothing has any impact, because they've got to have everything last 13 seconds before they cut away. Mm -hmm. So then we had this infuriating 10-minute period in which, I swear to God, this is what happens. I'll get into more detail here in a second, but 
We had TMZ clips of them asking Cookie about the JWoww deal. This lasted five seconds. We had an RVD segment backstage. Then we had a recap of the JWoww angle. Then we had another TMZ segment, which was the same one we'd seen earlier, just longer. And then when Robbie E. came out for his match with Red, they showed the JWoww segment again. Could you not have just shown the entire segment in its entirety once, and then the entire TMZ thing in its entirety once? Would that not have had more impact than to split those two things into two things and have four different segments, no, all of which, which were quick? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a tape show. So, yes, we had the TMZ thing, literally five seconds long. Then we had the RVD backstage deal where he's all pissed off. I have no idea about what. He was just pissed. Apparently, he wanted to know who did something involving Bischoff. That's what I got out of this. The announcers were talking later. Apparently, Eric had said something about one of the ECW guys talking to him about, about something. Apparently, spilling <laughs> insider secrets of some well, that, kind. That cleared it up for me. <laughs> Glad I could help. He shoved Raven, they had to pull apart, and then he s- just stole out of the room. No idea what's going on. Recap the Wow angle again, uh, which is a good thing, by the way, since it was the lowest rated segment on the show last week. So then they had clips of her backstage blowing it off, and then she said they need to settle this in the ring. So yes, this segment did the lowest rating of the entire two-hour block, and they're going to give her another $15,000. Which actually gives me a brand new respect for this woman. Sure. More power to her. Yeah. $30,000 from this fucking company. To kill the company. To get no ratings. So congratulations, JWoww. Showed another uh, TMZ segment, which was the same one as earlier, just a little bit longer. Then we had Robbie E versus Red, where they showed the JWoww thing again. So Robbie came out, squashed him. They had a two-minute match. RKO finish. I have no idea still if Robbie E is any good or bad. It was too short to determine. But yes, his finisher is the RKO. Which, as you pointed out, that was uh, Dallas Page's finisher. He was in the Jersey Triad mm-hmm. low these many years ago. So That's the point. Yeah. That's the point, everybody. It was 1999. I realize that they're, they're using Diamond Dallas Page's finisher because he was also from Jersey. But Diamond Dallas Page has not wrestled for years. Years! The WCW fans gave up. I mean, this is actually something they talk about in interviews. We'd love to get these fans back. Yeah, because they're gone. You've got a new group of people that are watching this show. So these people don't think of Diamond Dallas Page when they see the Diamond Cutter. Listen, how many of you watch this with friends? I know the answer is none. But if you did, and and your friends saw him use that move, what would they immediately think? They would think what I thought. They would think RKO. So, stop using Randy Orton's move. It's like using the stunner. It just comes off as, as second rate. And I'm not saying this because there are a lot of moves that you can use in other companies, like the choke slam, for example, or the downward spiral, or even the super kick, moves like that. But the RKO is so Randy Orton. Like It, it, it would be like if somebody used the FU, for example, in, in TNA. It would come off as, as, a, as a cheap ripoff. So use a different move. Use a downward spiral, for Christ's sakes. Everyone else does. Pope was in a strip club in New York. Allegedly. They flew a camera crew all the way to New York to film Pope in a strip club. Which actually, you know what? At least they're pretending like they've got money. More I, power to them. I doubt if any of you have ever been in a strip club, but since you're all wrestling fans, I imagine most of you have. First of all, women are usually naked. This woman was not. She was the most clothed stripper in stripping history. She was the most clothed woman on this show. I was going to say, yeah, she'd have been booed out of the impact zone in that outfit. Yes. Second of all, it was very, very light in there. Third of all, it was very quiet. Now, Pope did have a fat-ass chair. It was a big plush chair like flames embroidered on it. It was very cool. And he cut a fine promo, because he's the Pope, and that's all he does. And uh, he talked about fighting Fortune by himself and finally called out AJ and said he wanted to fight him. So he issued this challenge in New York, and later in the show they wrestled in Orlando. Yeah, just making sure. But it clips of Foley to book signing. He was starting to take questions from the audience, and a fellow named Brian asked a question, and it was Brian Kendrick. He had a question about mixed literary intentions. This was rare, good TNA comedy. It was, yeah, I, I thought this was a very funny segment. Because it's TNA, I assume it was not supposed to be funny. 
No, it was supposed to be funny. Because, yes, he, he is. This was designed to be funny. Can, can, uh, Foley was seeing the questions, and he says, yes, Brian Kendrick, and Kendrick stands up, and he asked a question nobody understood, and when he was done, everyone laughed at him. Yeah. I guess if that's their goal, then great. I thought this was supposed to make him look cool, of and they not. thought everyone laughing at him would make him look cool. Fortune had a classic heel meeting backstage in which they all took turns telling either an awful joke or something hilariously unfunny. And after saying it, all of the other guys laughed uproariously. Mm-hmm. Awesome heels. They, they addressed their various challenges and matches coming up. And then, I think it was AJ, said, where's my belt? And Rick goes, oh, here it is. And as he goes to pick it up, there is, in fact, a Smirnoff ice. And when he saw the beer bottle, he sold it. He threw his head back and his arms up, and he shook his head like Ric Flair does. <laughs> and I know I said last week that they were going to keep icing him until it was no longer funny. And I expected it to be no longer funny by this week, because the last time they did it, 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 it was not as funny. I'm afraid this one was great. <laughs> Ric Flair can save anything. He, he managed to make this funny again. He drank, he chugged it, of course, and... Uh, the only problem with this, and this is actually a major problem, is Flair gets cooler by the week. They're supposed to be the top heel group next to whatever the other group is called. These are supposed to be your baddest, meanest men, and instead they're out there every single week doing funny, popular-looking things. So, I don't know. It's probably one of the reasons there was absolutely no heat when they ran it at the end of the show and uh, and were trying to beat up the baby faces because no one knows how to react. No one knows who the baby faces like are anymore. Men. Yes. So the other problem with this, and this is actually most actually impact backstage segments anymore, it used to be when you had something backstage going on backstage, they would, uh, there would be an interviewer there. He would be talking to the wrestlers, and the wrestlers would look into the camera. And then, and this started in, in Raw probably almost a decade ago, they began doing backstage segments, slice of life little bits, where guys would be acting in front of the camera and somehow not notice there's a camera in front of them. TNA wants to do those but solve that problem. So what they do is they do these voyeuristic segments where the heels are backstage talking amongst themselves, hanging out, and there's a camera spying on them. Mm-hmm. Why can't they just do this, especially this one, where it's not like they were telling secrets. They were just telling jokes and laughing at each other. Why couldn't this just have been a promo? Well... I don't know. Okay. There will be a much worse one, in fact, in the next segment. Bischoff showed up and said in the AJ versus Pope match, if Fortune interfered, Pope would get the title. We'll talk about that in a second. We had a segment here that two hours ago I, I literally screamed at the top of my lungs. I've since calmed down a lot because, quite frankly, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Who cares? I really, I'm, I, I really don't care right now. I, what happened I'm no longer outraged. I am still boggled. I'm not even boggled. I'm just like, I, I'm a little bit boggled. Because, you know, we always talk about TNA repeating stuff from the 90s. And you know, it's one thing if you repeat something successful. But you they have a track to copy the NWO. We understand why you might do that. They, they copy everything that, that was a failure, you see. Yes. And so, you know, i got to be honest with you. I never thought, and keep in mind, everybody, the faith I have in TNA, and keep in mind how stupid I think these people are. I really, honest to God, never thought that they would recreate Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior in the mirror. For those of you that don't understand, who weren't around at the time, Warrior debuted in WCW doing an interview it was like a 20-minute promo. It did a huge rating. And there was tons of interest in the return of the Warrior. At that point, they decided to have Warrior do magic. He would appear and disappear at will. And there was a moment, a couple of them actually. Hulk Hogan was backstage. And Warrior appeared in the mirror. And spoke to Hulk Hogan. And... Some dudes ended up walking in, and they couldn't see anyone in the mirror. And so the the idea was, Hulk Hogan is crazy, because he's seeing things in the mirror that no one else is seeing. Well, the problem was, we were also seeing it. This was so fucking stupid. So, as in fact, the viewers at home and Hogan were saying, it was the other guys running into the room that were crazy. Yeah, so they couldn't see what we were clearly seeing in the mirror. The point is, they were trying to they were trying to convince us that Hogan was hallucinating 
by showing us what he was seeing. This is really stupid. So, and I can't do this justice, everybody. Go, go YouTube this. It's up there right now. In fact, I should play it here on the show. Yes. Let me try that here real quick. Let's see. If I, I can explain what's going on while you do the searching. No, no, no. All right. I, I. Uh, you, want, you want the entire experience? Yep. Hogan. Oh, I thought you meant the one from tonight. No. Hogan Warrior Mirror. I don't know if this will do justice, but let's play it. Here we go. Hogan's going back to his own locker room now. Daughter, you idiots. I guess come on, man. Take him out. Take him out. Where's he at? Hey, he was just here. I saw him come in here. You saw him come in here. That warrior. Look, look at that. Look at his face. What the? What? Look at... Hogan's coming. He's in the wall. Oh. He's in the mirror. Oh. Hogan. 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 He's in the wall. He's in the mirror. Hogan is looking right at the warrior in the mirror, which we can also see. But Eric Bischoff did not see him. Oh, Eric Bischoff. He never see him. Mother, I know the rules. I the number. You the cycle. Just play the game. Eric is poking Hogan on the shoulder. You think it's funny? Look at the water. You're really talking to Eric. Eric. I believe the announcers afterwards might have also tried to pretend like they didn't see the warrior in the mirror, even though they just said that they did. So anyway, one of the all-time stupid segments in wrestling history, the warrior, the magic warrior in the mirror who then disappears. Well, on impact, everyone. First off, even more ridiculous than that is Brooke's ass shows up. And, of course, she'd been all bitchy to the other girls until Eric fired her for being a whore. And I'm not making any of this up, everybody. So she walks into the locker room, and she's all sad now. And she wants help learning to wrestle from, among people, Velvet Sky and Lacey Von Eric. Yes. I call shenanigans. <laughs> well, I, I don't call know. complete bullshit. She may not know any better. She may think they're really good. So they tell her to fuck off, bitch, almost in those exact words. I was actually expecting to be much more degrading to her. Yeah. They, they, they call her a bitch once, and that was that. So Velvet and Lacey leave, and Angelina is there alone. And suddenly a figure appears behind her. It's Katie Lee Birchall, who claims her name is Winter. Ah, that what she said. And she, I thought she said Quinta. Winter. Winter. She acts all creepy. And she Angelina... She speaks in a weird, robotic, monotone voice. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, she was acting very creepy. She was basically... The gimmick seemed like she was stalking. Or something. I don't know. Angelina. Haunting, and perhaps. That's a better word. Because you see, Angelina turns to shake her hand, and as she does so, in walk Velvet and Lacey... And Winter is not there. Mm-hmm. She's disappeared. No one can see her except Angelina. And, of course, us! Yes, we, the viewers, can see what's going on inside Angelina's head. I cannot even believe this. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. I cannot even believe this. What other stupid stuff can they do? Can they bring back the Yeti? I, I, I now am expecting them to have a, uh, a, a Triple Tower of Doom match. A Hardcore Junkyard Invitational. A Hardcore Junkyard Invitational. Now you put I, someone into a box? Literally, now that they've that. recreated Hogan and the Warrior in the Mirror, I put absolutely fucking lutely nothing past them. Like, I can't think of a single thing that I do not expect them to do at this point. I just couldn't even believe that I saw this. So, yeah, there you go, everybody. Then we had uh, AJ and Pope in a street fight for the title. And yes, in the first singles match in their feud. Not only that, not only that, the rules were that if Fortune interfered, it was a DQ. Here in this no DQ match, <laughs> and because you see, it's impact everybody. <laughs> it's impact, and if there's a DQ in this no DQ match, the title can change hands on this DQ <laughs> in the no DQ match. Right. So they had a street fight. They wore jeans. They punched each other a lot. They did some stuff, and then. Right at the very end, when it appeared Pope was going to win, Abyss came in. Oh, and by the way, for those of you confused like I was, AJ is the television champion. And, and yeah. 
It's easy to forget. It was the is the TV belt that was the global belt that was the Legends belt. When he was looking for the belt with Ric Flair, I I just thought it was a world title. <laughs> oh right, that that is how little this championship belt means to me. I mean, maybe this is his belt. All those Levi's. I completely had blocked out of my mind that Jeff Hardy was a champion. I just who cares? That that is how important this title change was at their biggest show of the year. I don't even know who he won the title from. Who was the champion before Jeff Hardy? It was a tournament final. Oh, that's right. There wasn't one. <laughs> Jesus. Because they stripped RVD, and then he was back <laughs> before the tournament was before over. Before the tournament was over. He did not even get to be in the, fat, the final match. Because it was so important that they got the title on somebody, that they stripped RVD of it. Even <laughs> though he was back before they crowned a new champion. Yes. This company's stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Uh, so, so yeah, so yes. Uh, anyway, they had the match, and the finish was Abyss came out and interfered and beat up Pope, and so AJ won. And what's funny to me was, even though this was totally in the, within the rules of this no DQ street fight, AJ makes the cover, and suddenly Earl Hebner is disgusted, and he counts a slow, reluctant three. Why? Who cares? I don't, I don't care. You know, I just am. Um, I I really. The more I think about it, there are like a lot of fans now that this is what they're growing up on. That's really sad. Yeah, no, you're right. Like, like it's just, you know, I know there are going to be people on the board that are very upset about this review, and they're going to talk about what a great show they thought it was. And really, all I feel is like a, a great deal of sadness that that standards for professional wrestling TV have fallen to th- these depths. That like Impact is now considered by many people to be a good show. It just saddens me that these people have never actually seen a good wrestling show, apparently. You know, the, like, this is the standard for good shows nowadays. I take my girlfriend's nephews to the Tulalip shows. They love them. They have a great time. Last time I was driving up there, they, uh, I knew they played the video games and they have all the WWE toys and that. And last time I was driving up there, they mentioned that they watch Impact. And I was saddened and disgusted. I need to take these things that I'm reviewing for the newsletter and give them over to them. <laughs> Say, listen, young ones. These are memories of a bygone time when things were good. It really is. It's like it, it, it's it's a lost era when 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 wrestling shows had to make sense and be good to get people to watch them. Now you just do a whole bunch of bullshit and you do a whole bunch of angles and you do a bunch of shit that makes no sense. And this is now like considered good. That like that pains me a little bit. I, I feel like one of those old people that talks about back in the day. But this is like undoubtedly true. true. Well, okay. Uh, the only thing is, I think this is even worse. Most of the stuff that's really good is actually like even before we started watching. That's true, actually. So maybe we, we, even we are not old enough to really appreciate it. Serena was doing yoga somewhere. Okay, yeah. Speaking of things that make no sense, suddenly a woman appeared on screen. She was speaking English. <laughs> she was cutting a promo on Mickey James. She was speaking Canadian, to be honest with you. She's speaking Canadian, and it took me several minutes to realize this was Serena. Yeah, she's she she for one segment here she was a Canadian. Mm-hmm. After being a Mexican the entire time, she's, she's been here. a Mexican who only speaks Spanish the entire time. Now she's a Canadian who speaks Canadian for no reason, who speaks English for no reason, and was doing yoga for no reason. Although I am not complaining about that last part. Pope bitched at Joe backstage for not helping him. Joe's a man on his own. Pope said, "This is bigger than the two of us. We should work together." And I was just wondering, for what purpose? I don't know. Team 3D talked about their retirement stip. Said so they'd been thinking about this for a long time. Figured Bound for Glory was the place to do it. There was nothing left for them to do. They were hanging it up. Bubba There's... said, there are a lot of things we want to do. devon has got a real big family. I've got some music projects lined up. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? what? Bubba Ray is going to start a music career, you see. Fascinating. I did not know that. He's going to do more raps about New Jack. And then we had the segment of the night. Actually, wait, no, I must cut you off here. Well, one more thing about the 3D promo. Bubba mentioned that either they would defeat the machine guns and win the titles and go out on top, or the machine guns would get would beat them and they would get to brag about being the team that retired 3D. So it's a win-win, he says. This is why it's important every once in a while to watch a show with non-fans. Because there's a person in the room who is not a fan. And they watched this segment and asked, if it's a win-win, why should I care who wins enough to buy it? <laughs> I had no answer. I didn't have an answer either. So, yes. Then we had a segment where I I have concluded that Vince Russo took a hat, and he put in a whole bunch of names and a whole bunch of tasks and some a, sort of comedy. A Mad Lib is wrestling skit? That's what this was. This is, I swear to God, this is what happened. 
The machine guns are outside the building somewhere. And they're playing catch with a football. And they're about six, seven feet from each other. Yes. And they're throwing the ball back and forth. And Velvet Sky is there. As I recap this, it's like, I had a dream last night. I had a dream that the machine guns are playing catch from about seven feet away with a football backstage, and Velvet Sky is there. She is trying to talk to Saban about something, and he's ignoring her. And I guess they're gay here in this dream that I had. And the cameraman is yelling something. And finally, Chris Saban turns around and says, What? And as he's saying this, up walk the young bucks. One of them intercepts the football. He throws it and hits Chris Saban in the back. Chris Saban turns around, and they begin yelling at each other. And Velvet Sky walks over and stands in front of the guns in my dream. She takes off her shirt. Actually, she didn't do that, unfortunately. That would be a dream. So This was just surreal. Then the, the, the bucks are like, oh, you're standing behind a woman. And the guns say, I don't know what they said, but they just, they just went around the girl. <laughs> and one of the guns in this dream punches the blonde buck who falls on his ass. And then they all just stop. And they look at each other. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I missed a very important <laughs> part here. I missed a very important detail. The, the, the bucks in this dream are telling the guns that they're hiding behind a girl. And so the guns go after them, and right as the attack is about to start, Velvet Sky puts a pie in the blonde one's face. Yes. I'm not making this up. This is what happened. I don't know why she had a pie. Why would she hang out with the young guns? She did not have a pie earlier when she was talking to Chris Saban. She just all of a sudden had a pie. And she put it in the blonde one's face. And then one of them punched the blonde one, and he fell on his ass. Then they're all looking at each other. And there's like a long pause. And there's, there's great tension. And then they all just walk away from each other. <laughs> Am I making a, a single part of that up? No. You got that in exquisite detail. What was this? No, I don't know. Why was Velvet Sky with the guns? No, that's Why it. did she put a pie in the... That, that is the remarkable thing about this. It's not just that the entire thing made no sense. It's that every detail of it made no sense. Why were the guns playing catch from no more than ten feet apart? I don't know. Why did the... Okay, think of all the nefarious things evil men have done in wrestling. <laughs> on this show alone, they attacked a man with a bad shoulder, like, eight on one, and laid him out. They cheated to win. They threw chairs at each other. The Young Bucks tried to get heat by stealing a football. And throwing it at a man's back. This is a third-grade feud. So anyway, this Passing was... Passing a settlement in a game of Foursquare. This was so weird that, like, I expect to wake up tomorrow and, and this was all a dream. We, we had a mass hallucination, you and I. Yeah. I mean, this was just remarkable. So, Jeff was backstage bitching, that being Jared. And uh, he said he was going to go to the ring to apologize to Kurt. And, of course, he goes out there to apologize, but then says, I'm sorry, I didn't beat you up worse. Every heel promo we ever heard... Celebrate Kurt being gone forever. I would like like Mookie Ghana or or uh, somebody who who is good with stats and who cares to go back and and find the number of times that Jeff Jarrett has had a match in the last two years and the number of times in which it's merely been a segment with him bitching. I would bet you anything it's like two matches per one hundred bitching segments. All this guy ever does is bitch. I can't even remember the last match Jeff Jarrett had. What was the last match he had? I believe it was on the pay per view, but I missed it. Was he in the six man? He walked out on Joe. Oh, that's right. That doesn't count. He was in for like two seconds and he walked yeah. out. Point is, know. all he does is come on TV and bitch. All I know is, yeah. I, and, and my favorite line in here was, he was going over the their long history, his own Kurt Angles, and he said that he gave Kurt a job when nobody else wanted him. That's a lie. I was trying to figure out if this is supposed to be heel heat, like that's the heel is telling us a blatant lie, like when Dick Murdoch would use a weapon and then deny it. Or when they were cheating on them, on them in the match, and Bobby Heenan would say his monitor went out so he couldn't comment. 
Or, or if they're just that stupid. Yeah, it's just that stupid. Okay. So, uh, Gunner and Yudi, as I'm going to call them now, uh, came out and uh, handcuffed Joe. And yes, Joe could not beat up the two geek security guards. And they handcuffed him, and then Jeff threw him off the balcony. And we got a, and this is a show-long storyline, Tanae and, and Taz bitched each other the entire show, and then Tanae stood up and bitched out Jeff Jarrett. So apparently they're going to split up the announcers or something like that. I don't know if Don West is going to come back. I assume we're going to get a Tanae versus Jarrett match. We might. That would suck. we got to get moving here. Sarita, or Sabu and RVD against Beer Money. Uh, a finish saw Sabu grab a chair. He threw it. It hit RVD in the head way too hard. And then Sabu and RVD, after RVD got pinned, had to pull apart. Guys came down broke it up. Who cares? This is where Stevie was trotting down the ramp, I think we can say. That's right. Sabu also did a spot where he tried a high kick, he missed, and then he did a karate chop to Robert Roode's neck. He... This was the highlight of the year. <laughs> okay. I made that up. Flair and Bischoff and Kazarian discuss the Ultimate X match, so apparently it is Ultimate X, for mm-hmm. those of you wondering. And this is another voyeuristic promo. Before that, Mickey James cutting promo atop a bull for Christ knows what reason. Well, he's hardcore country. I see. So, Sarita, and uh, by the way, I wonder if uh, if hardcore country is supposed to be some sort of a very lewd play on words. Probably is. No, but, yeah, it, it sounds like a porn movie that's been made. Sounds like something that uh, Vince Russo would make up to uh, get his jollies. Sarita and Mickey... Sarita was a Mexican again here. Mickey wore short jean shorts, which she was constantly adjusting. Still the longest and best TNA women's match in I don't know how long. Yeah. Mickey made a comeback, and it was funny and sad in that she did a bunch of moves. Everybody was going crazy. She did this giant Fez press off the top. Everybody went crazy. And then she did, like, a, a wacky super kick. That weird spinning she does. It did not look good. It did not look good, and the crowd died. And then that was the finish. Yeah, that was kind of sad. Time for a new move. The other highlight here, and this is actually, at first, my highlight of the entire show. Mickey was wearing brown boot, brown boots with, like, fin- fringe on top, and Taz referred to them as John Nord boots. Mm-hmm. And actually, if he had just left it there, it would have been my favorite line of the show, but then he and Taz began to talk about it, or he and Tanae talked about it for, like, five minutes, and killed the joke dead. Mickey, by the way, since her time on Raw, has lost a lot of weight, too. You think so? I do. I think she looks exactly the same. Mm. Perhaps it's just more flattering gear. Mr. Anderson did a... Uh, I didn't think it was all that flattering, actually. Mr. Anderson did a promo with his arm in a sling. And uh, this was this was a mind-boggling segment. So the story is that he got his shoulder destroyed. And uh, so he had a sling on the whole time. And he was being forced into a match with a sling on his arm. And he does this promo, and maybe I'm mistaken. But... I could have fucking sworn that he said he had a busted shoulder and a broken leg. No, no, that's what he said. He said his leg was broken. Now, obviously he didn't really have an injured shoulder, but his shoulder was taped up, and in the storyline he had an injured shoulder. Nowhere in the storyline did he break a leg. So, why did he come out here and say that he had a broken leg? Because he turned the entire injury into a joke. Like, all of his injuries he made a joke out of by claiming he had an injury that he clearly did not have. I don't know. I don't know why this man does anything. So he claims he has a broken leg, which he doesn't. And he comes out and Fortune attacks him and beats him up. Okay. Two things. First of all, this is a seven-on-one attack or so on an injured man. A man with a busted shoulder and a broken leg. And as these men are heinously attacking him, first of all, Mike Tanay asks, direct quote, What's this, Taz? (laughs) They take him out of the ramp. They're destroying him. They're laying waste to this man, this poor, innocent man who has done nothing to offend them. And the crowd responds to about four guys going, Oh. Yeah. No one. No one cared. So Kazarian comes out, and they have an Ultimate X match. And the X, there is no earthly way that the bottom of the X was higher than 10 feet in the air. I mean, absolutely no way. Because at one point, Kazarian was hanging from the, the the cables, and Mr. Anderson went to grab him, and Mr. Anderson's head went up to at least Kazarian's waist. Mm-hmm. And so when Kazarian fell off the cables, he dropped maybe three feet to the ground. So it was a ridiculously low X, which made the match come off as a complete joke. And, and granted, I don't want to see people falling from a great height, but 
why even bother if you're going to have the X this low? There was a point. I don't know. There, there was a point where uh, Kazarian was going for the X, and Anderson yanked him off. And Kazarian took a flat back bunk from basically the, the top of the cables, essentially. He, yeah. he was kind of swung himself up and then let go. That was more than enough. I do not need to see any more of those. No. Then you retire this X. So they uh, had a match. Anderson ran wild. And if, you're, if you must do it, don't do it on the same show you announce it. Use it to build an audience for the next show. The thing, Fortune ran down, of course, and uh, helped Kazarian win. Yeah, they, they, they came this, out. This show, did this again. They attacked him at the beginning, left him laying, but then when he made a comeback, they did not attack him for several more minutes. Yeah, this this show, I mean, I, I uh, we'll get the, the numbers tomorrow, but no way this was not the lowest rated quarter on the show. I mean, I, I, uh, I so didn't care by this point. In fact, I, I put this, we didn't even mention this. After Mickey's match, she won, which is a minor miracle, and within three seconds, Tara had hit the ring and was beating her up. Who cares? This, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm moving on now. I I'm, I'm know, done with this show. This is, your, your, this is my question from Mookie Gannon. When was, when was the last time there was a match on Impact where someone won, they hit a move, and they won, and there was no angle or promo or never. attack on Impact? Never. Has it ever happened? Never. Okay. I'm ending the show. I'm tired. <laughs> they so, attacked him. They helped Kazarian win. There was blood. We talked about the finish, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Anderson grabbed a pipe to make his own comeback. Uh, Jeff Hardy made him bleed with a chair. It was very gross. Then as he's laying there, concussed and bleeding, Jeff still has to do the angle. So he puts the arm in a ladder and whacks the ladder with a chair. So then the show is not over. I'll summarize this. Summarize this quickly. This often so Claire got this. into a car. They tried to drive away. Kurt Angle got in the way with a pipe. He broke the pipe with a window. Gunner and Murphy chased him away. And then the show ended. Why do Gunner and Murphy run off all of the wrestlers? Why does anything happen on the show? Let's leave. Gunner and Murphy. I'm like mind boggled here. It's not like it's it's like, you know, Scott Norton and the Warlord. It's Gunner and Murphy. I could beat up Gunner and Murphy. Kurt Angle with a pipe got ran off by Gunner and Murphy, empty handed. I'm done with this show. To the back Let's get going here with this program, Impact. You'll never guess, everyone. This was a bad television show. I know that there are going to be Impact fans that say, No, it was great! More power to you. I'm happy you liked it. <laughs> I'm happy. I've said it before. Thank God for fans like you. Thank God for fans like you that... I mean, you ensure I'll always be able to do this for a living. Because your standards are so goddamn low that this is considered a good television program. This may not necessarily be the same people that buy your newsletter. In fact, if I were in your place, I would hope they were not. You know, I gotta say something about this show. This is just, this is just this just. I mean, again, I've said this a million times. They they always still manage to surprise me with their stupidity. So the story of this show was that Mr. Anderson got hit with a chair in the back of the head last week by Jeff Hardy, and he suffered a concussion. Now, the storyline was that the heels that run the ship were going to force a concussed Mr. Anderson back into the ring. Matt Morgan and one of the head trainers and various people on the show were looking out for the best interests of Mr. Anderson. Matt Morgan, in particular, was on a crusade. He's a card-carrying member of the Sports Legacy Institute, he said. Everybody knows about concussions now. This ain't the old days. Everyone knows about head injuries and how dangerous they are. Therefore, Mr. Anderson should not be wrestling tonight. So, of course, Eric and Flair and Jarrett and all these old fuckers, they all work through their injuries. Concussions never stop them. So, therefore, they were commanding Mr. Anderson to get into the ring for the match tonight. So, at the end of the show, Matt Morgan comes out. It's supposed to be Jeff Jarrett and Mr. Anderson in a chain match. And for those of you wondering why Jeff Jarrett and Mr. Anderson are having a chain match, the answer is, as always, why not? Why not? Why not have a chain match for no reason? So they're about to have the chain match, and Matt Morgan comes out instead of of uh, Mr. Anderson. And Matt pleads his case to Jeff Jarrett, saying this should be about safety 
We need to look out for each other. We need to take care of each other. We cannot let injured people work. It's actually all very timely and... Reasonable. Reasonable. It was good stuff. So, Jeff Jarrett says, fuck off, I want to do this match. This makes Matt angry. Matt puts the chain on his wrist, and he says, I'm going to kick your ass, Jeff. Matt Morgan does the big babyface turn. Matt Morgan breaks away from fortune. Matt Morgan, the seven-foot giant, is now a babyface fighting for Mr. Anderson and the right of all the young guys to not work hurt. And he goes to town on Jeff Jarrett, and he beats him from pillar to post, and he pummels him hither and yon, and then Jeff Jarrett crotches him with the chain and pins him. Correct. You know, there. I thought maybe Fortune will run in. Maybe somebody will interfere to beat Matt Morgan. No. Jeff Jarrett, immediately after Matt Morgan's big baby face turn, Jeff Jarrett, in a fair fight, beat Matt Morgan clean. Like... I cannot even conceive of this. I think I did a quadruple take. I was watching this <laughs> match, and it didn't. It never crossed my mind that Matt Morgan would lose here. And he did, and I looked at you, and the TV, and back at you very quickly, and then the TV, I believe I did it four times. Just to... to and I, then I said, give me the clicker. Yes. I had to rewind and watch this again to make sure that I had, in fact, seen what I saw. Maybe all of Fortune ran out and interfered and we missed it, but no. In a fair fight, Jeff Jarrett beat Matt Morgan moments after his big baby face turn. Maybe six minutes later. Maybe less. I absolutely could not believe this one. Like, this one, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, this is this is the most elementary thing in the entire world. I can't even say that. You know, Sting beating Hulk Hogan clean at Starcade 97 was the most elementary thing in the world. They still had to fuck it up. I mean, that right there is just show in a nutshell. I just... And then he's going to be headlining the pay-per-view. So, no, yes. one's, no one's buying Turning Point, everybody. No. I'm spoiling that show right now. It's it's uh, it's Matt Morgan at uh, Turning Point uh, against Jeff Hardy for the title. So now you know what's going to happen. Don't watch Impact next week, and you don't need to buy the paper. I bet Morgan loses again. Of course he does. You kidding me? And if he doesn't, it's even dumber because a guy on a losing streak wins the title from Jeff Jer- uh, from Jeff Hardy a month after Jeff Hardy wins the belt. Either way, they're just moronic. It opened up with a brawl. <sighs> God damn, I hate these. <laughs> this segment sucked. Tara, so Tara and Mickey were fighting like in the catering area. Catering area. They were having, as wrestling fights go, a pretty intense fight, I guess. They were hitting each other hard, walloping each other, throwing each other in the, in the chairs. Meanwhile, they were surrounded by, like, a dozen grown men who did nothing to intervene. There was no security. They, this is how, hold on a second. This is how we have to explain this. This brawl went seven minutes. I'm not exaggerating even one minute. This went seven minutes. For those of you that have ever watched Impact... Do you know how long seven minutes is on this show? Four segments. An eternity. Yes. These girls fought forever. There were people everywhere. As you noted, no one made a move. No. No one tried to break them up. And it wasn't just... It started out as Mickey James and Tara. But then Sarita and the beautiful people and Madison Rain. There were like six girls all brawling for seven Minutes. And every time another girl ran on camera, the announcers were sure to point out, we don't know who this is. Yeah. Just a girl. They brawled in the back. They brawled through the curtain. They brawled out before the crowd. Nobody cared. I mean, dead silence. They brawled into the ring. After seven minutes, who should come out? Who should finally come out to bring peace to these, these women? But Ric Flair and a random man. It may have been Gunner or Yudi, I'm not sure. But Flair comes out, he got slapped, he grabbed the mic, he signed a six-person for later, Sarita, Tara, and Madison against the beautiful people and Mickey James, who he called a nut job. Now, for those of you that, I don't know if I should say haven't been paying attention, but are unaware, there were a lot of people in WWE that thought Mickey James was a nut job. Mm. Did you know that, Vinny? No. I actually guess most people don't. 
There were a lot of people in WWE that thought Mickie James was a nut job. I presume that's why Ric Flair called her a nut job on national television. Which, of course, is funny because in her entire time in TNA, she's never showed any signs whatsoever of being a nut job. Of course not. So apparently this was just a way to try to humiliate her in some way on, on national television. But he signed them to the six-person match for later, and that was a segment. This was excruciating television. Tanae, as Tara and Mickey were brawling, pointed out, this all started in WWE. Yeah, that's what he said. He couldn't even say before they came to DNA. No, he had to mention the, the, oppos- the opposition by name. Yeah. There was a point where Madison Rain and Velvet Sky were brawling near the announce desk. They were fighting on stairs, metal stairs, and they hit each other for a suplex, and I was terrified, and then the director cut away. Of course. I'm assuming they did not do a suplex off the stairs. I don't know. We don't know. So, yes, it went forever. It, it it did lead, by the end of this, I will admit, and this is a victory for TNA. It left me wanting to see a match. Unfortunately, that match is Ric Flair versus Mickey James. I don't think that's coming. Show Mr. Anderson being stitched up after last week. Pope showed up with a casket, and Tanae wanted to know what was in it. And Taz said, and I quote, Hopefully not some badass looking to take out an MMA guy. <laughs> You know, a reference to The Undertaker and Brock Lesnar. I guess so. Yeah, that's what he said, everyone. Hopefully not. <laughs> sure hope it was. Imagine the press they would have got. She'd pray that Undertaker was in there with Brock Lesnar. The two of them together in that casket. Eric? We then got the segment of the year. Of the year, you say? The, the, the Bischoff and Flair with the trainer. Huh? Basically... Bischoff was laughing at Flair for what had just gone on with the girls. Flair called one of the security guys a dumbass. Then the trainer walked in. Eric didn't know who he was. No one else knew who he, knew who he was either. He identified himself as the trainer. He explained Hi, that, I'm the trainer. Yes. <laughs> he explained that... It would be like if Tony walked in here tonight and said, Hi, I'm the administrator. <laughs> I'm the admin guy. <laughs> he uh, was concerned about the concussed Mr. Anderson going into this chain match. And what followed was just the biggest pile of shit ever. They made fun of the NFL for worrying about concussions. They said concussions were, quote, a boo-boo. Then Ric Flair, who has many positive traits, honesty is not high on the list. He said the NFL ratings are sinking and, D- and DNAs are going up. <laughs> That's what he said. This... Never mind, like, the, the highest rated games in the history of cable television <laughs> yes. this season. A number of them, in fact. Of the highest rated television programs ever in the history of cable. And TV's ratings are, in fact, not going up. No. They have one good show that they screwed up, and they've gone down since then. Yes. So, between... See, I didn't mind them. I don't know what to say about this. I didn't mind all of the stuff where they were making fun of, of the NFL and, and people... People wanting to take time off for concussions because that's the point. They are out of touch assholes. They were heels. You're supposed to be pissed off about it. Yes. And in the end, in the end, they they uh, you know the concussed guy did not wrestle. I didn't have a problem with the concussion thing on this show. I mean, they they did they did portray their own heels as like woefully out of touch, and I don't see that turning around anytime soon. But you know, still, it could have been much much worse. They could have said, it could have been Mr. Anderson saying this and then wrestling with a concussion. That would have been, that would have been shit. That would yeah. have been worse. I'd also like to know, what, how can they force someone to wrestle? Hey, can oh, they, they, they take himself out of the match? No, they didn't fire him. I see. They're in charge, you see. Hmm. So, uh, oh, we did have the, the, actually the reason this was the line of the century, or the, the segment of the century, was when the trainer asked, and I fucking quote right here, what happened to Dixie's policy about protecting our athletes from head trauma? That right there. That line right there should be the Wrestling Observer Newsletter 2010 Most Disgusting Promotional Tactic Award winner right there. That they actually had the fucking balls to say that. Rob Terry, chair shot anybody? I could go on and on. What happened to Dixie's policy about protecting our athletes from head trauma? Eric should have said, it never existed. <laughs> he should have said, we're taking it easy on this man. Flair should have said, that's a lie. There is no such policy. Anyway, Pope said he wanted a casket match with Abyss. A casket match. Why? They needed a box. Why not? Why not? So, 
abyss appeared in the crowd. He'd been instructed to take out the Pope. And then he, he said, yes, he said Bischoff and Hogan had ordered him to take out the Pope. Yeah. If Bischoff and Hogan don't like the Pope, why don't they just fire him? Because they want Abyss to hurt him. Hmm. And then they'll fire him, I guess. You should never say you want to take out the Pope. It does sound tasteless. Yeah. Pope should should get a... Uh, Got Sinead uh, O'Connor in a lot of trouble. A, uh, some sort of, of uh, Pope-mobile. Oh, my guaranteed, God. Guaranteed, guaranteed, uh, uh, Russo will bring that one back. Anyway. And that will be cool. Abyss said uh, that from now on, the fans were no longer safe. He said, you never know when, you never know where, but I am coming for all of you, one by one. And he then proceeded to grab two fans and drag them out of the building. He grabbed two fans, you see. Think about this. He grabbed fans. So, let's... Let's write down the crimes Abyss has committed on this show. He uh, attempted to murder Rob Van Dam. Attempted to kill RVD. Okay. He branded a man. <laughs> branded a man in perverse sexual manner. This Hopefully was, nobody comes across this list, by the way. <laughs> this was, at the least, prostitution. Yeah. Um, kidnapped. He kidnapped two fans here. Yeah, kidnapped fans. What else have we got? There's got to be more. Those are the ones I can remember. Destroyed really? property. Uh, I'm Van- sure he's done that. Vandalism. <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna uh, make a list and check it twice here of all the crimes that Abyss has committed. Meanwhile, he is still employed. Not he's, just employed. No one called the cops when he kidnapped no. fans. He grabbed two fans by the wrist, dragged them screaming to the back. Not one person. In the impact zone, gave a shit no. outside of the Pope. No one was scared. The Pope decided to save the day. Yeah. The other fans were like, huh, sucks to be them. No, the other fans were like, huh, that's stupid. Yes. He ain't going to get me, obviously. I'm not a plant. Jarrett challenged Samoa Joe to a match at the pay-per-view. Why? Who knows? Then said he was going to uh, take out Mr. Anderson later. Shouldn't Shouldn't Joe challenge the man who tossed him off the stage to the cement know. floor below? I don't know. So you killed Joe, and now you're going to challenge him to I a fight? I don't know. All right, just checking. Flair was hitting on a girl when Morgan interrupted. He was concerned about concussions because, quote, I have had tons of them. <laughs> Lovely. I shouldn't laugh, but what a stupid line. He had Jay Lethal versus Robbie E. You're downplaying this. First off, 31 minutes. That's true. 31 minutes without a match. Flair said, four decades I've been in this business, and uh, whatever Eric decided we need to support, he did not want to hear any of this. So there you go. Yes. The first match on the show began 34 minutes into the program. Mm -hmm. It was the first match in the feud between Jay Lethal and Robbie E. And so, of course, it was a Jersey Shore street fight. Of course. You always start your feud with a stip match. Of course. That's how it must go. So they had every 1999 WWF hardcore match you ever saw. They used a trash can. They used sticks. Sorted, they used uh, saw horses. Sorted other plunder. Saw horses. That is kind of a new one. That's the first time that word has ever been used on this program. <laughs> and hopefully the last. I bet you're right. So Lethal had the match won. He went up top to hit the big elbow, but Cookie sprayed hairspray into his eyes. Robbie, now his finisher is a neck breaker which is much better than the RKO. He hit the ne- neck breaker and won. It was what it was. I actually enjoyed this match. It was it was fine. It was fine. Then we had the beautiful people where they always are on impact, which is in the makeup room being made pretty. Because you see, they're not pretty. They've got to spend the entire show in the makeup room every week. So after Velvet left, Winter magically appears in the room. Now I want to talk about this for a while, because last week people got on me. They were like, Maybe she's really good at sneaking around. Yeah, maybe she sneaks around. Maybe maybe this is not a an image in the mirror. Maybe she's she just you know runs into the room and then runs out real fast. Well, let me tell you what happened in this segment, folks. So they're in the room getting their makeup did, and sitting over there in the corner is Jan, the makeup lady from WWE. I'm sure with a new name here in TNA, and she's uh, sitting there, and Velvet leaves. And in the mirror appears Winter. Now, Angelina does not look at Winter in the mirror this time. She turns around 
so that she apparently sees Winter in the room, but we don't see Winter in the room. We only see Winter in the mirror. So they have a, a conversation back and forth. Winter is acting all creepy, and suddenly Velvet returns, and Angelina grabs her and drags her into the room and says, Look, look! And she points, and who is there? Not Winter, Jan the Makeup Lady. So, this brings up many questions. The biggest of which is, what the fuck was happening here? If we presume, well, I mean, there are many things we can presume. Perhaps Winter is a shapeshifter. <laughs> Excellent. I had not thought of that. Yeah. She may be a mystique from the X-Men. She she was disguised as Jan, and then when Velvet left, she shapeshifted into Winter for the conversation. It's on her true form. And then when Velvet returned, she shapeshifted back to Jan. Mm -hmm. So if that's not the case, if if in fact Winter is a figment of Angelina Love's imagination, then when Angelina was there for two minutes having a conversation with Winter. What was Jan the makeup lady in the chair thinking? I don't know. Why did she not say anything? Why did she not stand up? Why did she not mention anything when Velvet returned? She was sitting there calmly as if nothing had happened. Apparently the entire conversation took place in Angelina's head. Furthermore, furthermore, if, if this is in fact a figment of Angelina's imagination, why are we seeing Winter in the mirror? That I don't know. Apparently we are also figments of her imagination. This is shit. We don't exist. This segment here, this angle is shit. There's also, this is down the list of things to complain about this segment, but Velva was in there with Angelina. She went to leave, and she was leaving because she declared she needed to go call Chris. Yeah. Now, you recall in last week's... Oh, was that Chris Saban? Uh, uh, that's my guess. In last week's dreamlike segment, <laughs> Velvet true. was inexplicably hanging out with the machine guns. I believe somebody posted that Velvet, uh, Velvet Sky and Chris Saban are, in fact, a couple. I did not fucking know that. So, I don't either. It's never been on Impact, but apparently we are just supposed to gather, because she was bothering them while he played football, that they're dating, and she had to go call him right now. I have no fucking idea that's what they're supposed to be doing here. Maybe I am jumping to conclusions. But that's... She said she needed to go call Chris. And if it's not Chris Saban, who the fuck is it? Maybe it's Chris Sparks. <laughs> it's Chris Abyss that she's calling. You know what's sad is I, I was trying to think of other Chris's it might be, and the first three names that came to my mind, all dead. I thought Chris Candido and Chris Clusteritis, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I didn't think of the third one. Who was the third one? Uh, Benoit. Oh, Benoit, I didn't yes. think. Yeah. Also did. I did not think that Belva was going to talk to Chris Benoit. Well, I'm, I glad, say she, that. I'm glad she is not. So then we had Tommy Dreamer saying that he's in the ring with all of his, his EV2 dorks. And he said, <laughs> first off, this whole thing is so stupid, I can't even believe I'm saying it here. He said... <laughs> It's true, isn't it? <laughs> he said, Rob, you have not returned our calls, our emails, our texts, or our tweets. Yeah. Now, listen, everyone. I know, well, obviously everyone on this spends a lot of time at their computer and on the Internet and online and stuff. And I know a lot of you may communicate via tweet with your friends. None of you are old wrestlers. That's not even the weirdest thing. <laughs> To me, it's like, one day, Whitney, who is now my wife, she was uh, she was on the island doing something for school. And, uh, and she said that she was going for a walk. And then incommunicado for like three hours. And uh, it was dark. And she had been walking alone on the beach. And so this was quite distressing for her. I recall this day. You remember this day? I remember oh, yeah. this day. This day sucked. This was actually the day after I, I was uh, frantically calling her mother that I think her mother decided it's okay for these two to get married. He does, in fact, love this woman. But anyway, so it ended up that there was like a... Uh, um, the place she was staying, she was staying in a uh, like a, a trailer-type deal on these people's property. A very long story. But anyway, they invited her in for dinner, and she hadn't brought in her phone. So that's why she was incommunicado for these three hours. But anyway, the point was, here I am thinking that she's been kidnapped. Okay? 
high on the list of things that I thought to do to communicate her, tweeting her was not one of them. Raven, or not Raven, Tommy Dreamer can't find Rob Van Dam, and so he's thinking, maybe if I send him a tweet, maybe I will contact him on Twitter. This was stupid. So It gets better. As you it gets better. Out, yes. So, yes, he cannot find this man. They've been trying frantically to find Rob Van Dam. He perhaps has been walking on the beach for three hours and disappeared. So they try to phone call him. No answer. They try to email him. He does not respond. They try to send him a text message on his phone. No response. Finally, they tweet. Nothing. So they come out here on impact. And after all of these problems, Tommy Dreamer says... Rob Van Dam, will you please come out? At which point he comes out. Yes. What? So, they did not, in fact, need the latest technology. They did not need the internet. They did not need the airwaves. All they needed to do, do was go, Hey, Rob! And he would come out. Not to mention the fact that you didn't find him backstage. <laughs> you were there all fucking day. Where was Rob? He comes out. We have our usual dreamer melodramatic promo. He says what happened last week with Sabu was an accident. RVD says, I don't know who I can trust anymore. At which point the fans go, ah, how sad. Yeah, they were... This is the only reaction in this segment, by the way. <laughs> they are dead silent throughout. So the gimmick here is that Rob is paranoid. So Raven steps up and says, you smoke too much weed. As we said. <laughs> which is funny. Yeah. Because that's a side effect, I've been told. And he then announced that Eric Bischoff is a genius like myself. Now that is something you want to take credit for. I am as much of a genius as I Eric am as Bischoff. Smart as Eric Bischoff. Yeah. So Fortune finally interrupted. Ric Flair talked for a while. He booked Rob Van Dam and Raven as a team versus Kazarian and AJ Styles. This pissed off Doug Williams. Yeah, you're missing the key to this segment. That being that. There are two factions, EV2 and Fortune. They are both, as of this segment, fighting with each other. Yes. So, yes, this pissed off Doug Williams for no discernible reason. They went to commercial, they came back, Fortune was backstage, bickering. Doug was not fitting in. They made fun of him for being English and assorted things. And He was mad because he wanted to wrestle. Yeah, so Flair said, okay, you can wrestle. And he took Cass out of the match and put Doug in. And everyone was happy. Yeah. So there you go. So then and we got a match. Tara and Madison and Sarita against the beautiful people and Mickey James. Uh huh. Fuck all you people. This was amateur hour. Oh my god, this is horrible. They had a spot where they got the heat on Mickey for a long time. And Mickey finally makes the hot tag to Angelina. Angelina gets in the ring and does about two moves, and then Mickey tags back in, and they get the heat on Mickey a second time. Who put this together? Wow. Then they try to do the spot where everybody does a move on everybody else, and finally, of course, the finish of the match is Sarita pinning Velvet. If I look through this lineup here, I can find a whole bunch of people that have issues with each other. Most notably, Tara and Mickey James. So, of course, the finish has to involve two people that have absolutely no issue with each other whatsoever. And are not in the top of the program. No. I mean, you could have had Mickey get a big win here. Just to get Mickey over. You could have had Tara get a big win here so for when she's fighting Mickey. No. Sarita pins Velvet, and nothing has changed. Amateur hour bullshit this, this was. This was horrible. Meanwhile, on commentary... Mike Tanay noted that Lacey Von Erich was involved. Why? Well, he explained, she is training Miss Tessmacher to wrestle. Yeah. There was a pause, and Taz said, Lacey? <laughs> and Tanay said yes, and at that point, Taz laughed out loud. <laughs> yes. This show has some redeeming qualities. Yeah, Taz. Pope was looking for the kidnapped people. This was not a redeeming quality, any of this. He heard screams and ran off. So, by the way, it's been 30 minutes, still no security. So they go to the break, of course. What better time? They come back from the break, and 
I swear to God, they're in the bowels of the building. What did Granny say where she lived? The gully? Down in the gully, in the dark. Yeah, they, were, they were in down in the gully in the dark, and all of a sudden you see two people running out of a room. They're fleeing, and they're screaming like a 1950s student film. I can't even say like a real movie. Oh. A student film from 1950, a horror film. So there's Abyss and Pope brawling, and again, they brawl forever. And this leads to Abyss putting him in the box. He put him in the coffin, and he shut the lid. He was putting him in the coffin while, I can't even say cutting a promo, he was delivering a soliloquy. Yes. Like a bad movie villain. So he puts him in the casket, and he says, where's Janice? And he goes into the gully, and he grabs the nail-covered board, and of course, now he's going to open the lid and find the Pope inside and hit him repeatedly with this board covered with nails and kill him. Or not. He goes back there and he begins begins beating on the coffin with the board. The coffin, mind you. He doesn't open the lid. Pope is in the coffin and he just hits the lid with the board and then he just tips it over. Then they cut away and we never see them again. Pope may still be in the coffin right now. On the floor of the impact zone. Tipped over. I guess... I, I first of all, here's where you can have property damage. Because that's true. Because Abyss uh, that's just attempted murder. Let me at least put that one that down. Too, yes, that, he, that's repeated. He uh beat the hell out of this coffin, which got all dented up. What a cheap ass coffin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what a rinky dink show. So yes, this sucked. Generation Me did a promo saying it was all about them. Which, by the way, led to Taz and Mike burying Generation Me by talking about how they represented this new young generation of people who felt they were entitled to everything. Apparently, the impact... Way to bury your prime <laughs> All of your fans, yes. Apparently, impact is designed only for those age 55 and up. Well, actually, that's their best demographic, to be honest with you, but... I just feel like WWE, when they, when they were burying people who play video games and people who are on the Internet. Yeah. Okay, that's stupid. So... I realize we bury our board, but... Have you been on the board? I mean, everybody does. So, anyway, they uh, come out, and, and Generation Me, Jesse Neal and Shannon Moore, and Machine Guns in a three-way. And uh, Shannon made fun of Generation Me, saying 1998 called, and Matt and Jeff want their gear back. They had a match. They told them they had some sweet tennis shoes. You know, that was funny. All action excitement. This was a fun match. This was a fun match. And uh, after the Guns won... Actually, there was one stupid thing, of course. Of course. You you had uh, Ink, Ink with the titles being won, but the G uh, Generation Me pulled the referee out of the ring. I mean, they grabbed his foot, and they yanked him out of the ring, and he landed on the ground and looked right at them. And did this signal a DQ? No. The ref said, and I quote, What the heck are you doing? <laughs> and then he just got back in the ring, and the match continued. I hate that. Not to mention... Can you just have a match? Uh, not to mention... Why would you want Ink Ink to get a visual pin on the Tag Champs, leading into the Tag Champs big match with 3D? Hadn't even thought of that. There's always something. To be honest, there's always another layer of stupidity in the show. It's like a big stupid onion. You peel back later and there's still more. Bubba came out, did a babyface promo, talked about all the great teams, and how they wanted to uh, have the match with the Machine Guns at the pay-per-view, the Machine Guns accepted. It was during this segment that it was like blatantly, ridiculously clear that Team 3D is going to turn heel when the titles do not retire. Of course. They also, uh, it, during the match, by the way, Taz was talking about the steps for the match, which are, theoretically, 3D is going to retire either way. They can either retire with or without the belts. Taz was talking about these steps, pointing out how they made no sense, and there was no, nothing to gain for uh, the machine guns at all, because 3D is going to retire either way. So, yes, again, he's pointing out how stupid the show is. And we had uh, the deal with Morgan trying to talk Eric out of the deal. Eric was talking about it's all about money and ratings. And Matt did admit that he had once kicked Matt Morgan's or Hernandez's head into a post and given him a concussion. But he said at least he was only out three months, or he was out three months. Somehow this was strange logic to me. Well, because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it is strange logic, but he's, his point was, it is not a crime to give a man a concussion. It is a crime to force a concussed man to wrestle before he is fully healed. Yes, of course. There's, there's, it makes a certain amount of sense. No, it doesn't. 
So Taz said uh, he thought he understood Morgan's point, but he felt he was going too far, and Tanae was appalled, said, oh, do you think that Anderson should work? And Taz said, I never said that. Anyway, the point is, the announcers are, are building up a feud. I don't know where it's going to go or why, but they are. We had a Jeff Hardy promo which featured one of the lines of the year, and there were several on this show, when he said that Bischoff and Hogan convinced him that fan approval never made him any money. Indeed. There are few men in the last five years who have made more money than Jeff Hardy because he is a fan favorite. I can think of John Cena, and that may be it. That's the end of the list. Boy, did they sell this fucker a bill of goods. So then we had Raven and RVD against AJ and Doug Williams. RVD sold forever. Okay. First of all, <laughs> Raven, the finish here. Yes. Raven came out first. The heels jumped him. They were beating him up. RVD comes out. He is making his big entrance to the pyro. He is slowly walking in the ring as Raven is being double teamed. That's part of the story, so that's not necessarily stupid. But when he gets there, he makes a save, and Raven doesn't care. No, he's over it already. Yeah. So they do the match. They're wrestling. Ric Flair sneaks down to ringside. He attacks Raven. He hit him with the belt, I believe. He hit him with the Legends title. And he leaves Raven lying on the floor. In dead man's position. In dead man's position, bleeding lying, from the head. Sprawled out, hands and legs splayed, dead on the ground. Right. So they have the heat on Rob. He's beaten and beaten and beaten. He fights back. He goes to make the tag. And he sees Raven on the floor. And he says, and again, this is a quote, What are you doing? <laughs> what the heck are you doing over there? What are you doing over there? That's what he said. Yes. What the heck are you doing over so, there? The announcers then claimed, Well, he didn't see Ric Flair leave Raven out. What do you expect him to think? <laughs> <laughs> I... Apparently, in Rob's situation, we are supposed to assume that Raven has decided in the middle of this match to lay down on the arena floor and take a nap. I figured that Raven just thought that he'd passed out. Or perhaps he may have overdosed. Yeah. These are RVD thought he just passed out in the middle of the match. Regardless, there's no explanation other than to assume Raven had deliberately betrayed him. Yes, of course. So Rob was beaten To up. Rob, Raven decided he was going to just go lay down. <laughs> He's going to go take a nap on the floor. I am going to I'm going to leave you high and dry and render myself prone. Ha-ha. I'm not I going to walk to the back. No. I'm not going to turn on you. I'm going to go lay on the ground. I'm not going to take one of these nice comfy seats in this arena. No. I'm going to lay on the hard, cold, concrete floor. Sure. So, Rob no, Van No, there's more. <laughs> I am not going to walk to the back. I'm not going to betray you. I'm not going to take a seat in the front row. I'm going to go lay on the carved cold cement floor in spread eagle position and cut my head open. Yes, I'm also going to bleed. Yeah. <laughs> he must so, be betraying me here. So, the lesson of this match is Rob Van Dam is the dumbest man on earth. <laughs> That's the story they told. And then he, Raven got pinned, or RVD got pinned. He was eventually double teamed and pinned, and they... Yelled at each other or something. There's and a lot of yelling here. Raven just threw his hands up and walked away. What a moron, he said. We then got clips of the TNA stars on Family Feud. I don't know, this looks fun. Well, you're watching it, not me. All right. We had... <laughs> okay, this is the main event of the show, everyone. Jeff Jarrett versus Mr. Anderson in a chain match. Jarrett came out with a chain. Mr. Anderson's music played. Morgan came out instead in a shirt that was somehow way, way too big for him. I don't know where he found that. And then Impact ended. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that so for all of you in Australia and England, I'm sorry you didn't see the end of the show, but that I thought it'd be really cool to have it stretch into Impact or to reaction again. Impact stopped being on TV. Yeah. It is every week, Vince. Why does this surprise you this time? It was so perfect here. Even... If everything had gone according to plan, it still would have ended with Anderson with his arm in a sling and his head concussed, stumbling down the ramp as the show ended. Mm -hmm. So we were back in 1988. Vinny, are you forgetting last week they went off the air right before the main event started? <laughs> it, it never fails to, to baffle me. So anyway, then they did the whole deal, and Matt Morgan got beat clean as a sheet. There was also a point where... He made his promo about how concussions are dangerous. We know more now. He made all his... Reasonable, salient points. 
And he got a mixed reaction that was about two thirds booze. <laughs> fans did not they want to hear. These are pro brain trauma fans. Yeah. So anyway, a bad television show. Don't watch this. This show. was bad professional wrestling, everyone. It was better than last week. I had at least that type. Can I send out my plea again? Everybody, expect more. Demand more. You do not have to lower your standards. You don't have to lower your standards. You just don't. Wrestling does not have to suck. No. It really doesn't. 